Kicking off the list at number 10, Dirty Beds. Okay, so far on this disgusting series, I can't believe we're on part seven, but we've talked about storing chamber pots under your bed. Pretty yuck, that's if you were lucky enough to have a bed, of course. If you were rich in the 1400s, having a bedroom was the talk of the town. You would have guests over to hang out in your bedroom. That was like the place to be. Social gatherings in your bedroom, that's my worst nightmare. A couple of nights talking about noble deeds, meanwhile you're all tucked in with your ass out, hair all messy, half asleep, like, huh, who is it? Most of the time in the 14th century, your mattress wasn't even a mattress, it was just a pile of straw. It was horrible, you had to sleep in your clothes, the same tunic and cloak you've worn all day, remind you, because you'll freeze at night otherwise, right? Because you're basically outside, these barns, this old wooden, not great. Also, these beds weren't in your rooms or anything, they were just like tucked in a corner. You didn't have social gatherings around the sack of straw, you know what I mean? Your bed was more often than not riddled with bird poop as well. You weren't alone in these cold rooms, you know, birds hiding up above. Also, spiders? I don't even want to know. I don't even want to dive into that. Let's move on. Number nine, mouthwash. Ancient Romans would use urine as mouthwash. I believe we've mentioned that before on this, again, disgusting series. It's always a fun fact to bring up at a house party next time you're drinking some Mountain Dew. Just be like, oh, did you know? The ammonia in urine was thought to ideally wash away the yuck. You just got to get past the whole urine part, I guess. Doctors hate this one trick. Mm. Nero would tax the trade of imported bottled urine. That's how popular it was at this point. Some poor soul with a clipboard would have to stand all day and just be like, yep. In the 12th century, St. Hildegard von Bingen would advise all to wash their mouth with cold water to remove bacteria. Yeah, if only it was that easy, okay? Just one quick sh and spit it out and then you're good, no. I wish it was that easy, pal. Tortoise blood was also used once as mouthwash alongside goat milk and vinegar. Out of those three options, imagine not picking goat's milk. You're like, hmm, but what year is the tortoise blood? Number eight, bath beans. Not to be confused with bath bombs, bath beans we're talking about. Bath beans, beans in the bath. Bath beans were used thousands of years ago in ancient China. They were these bars, or beans rather, these chunks, they like beans. They're made of bean powder, herbs, and much like our bath bombs today, they also included some nice fragrances. Just have a little bit of a, mm. The pancreas of a pig was also commonly used, so it wasn't totally nice. Once the blood was drained, you'd mix it with the bean powder and the nice stuff. Now, originally it began by using leftover water from cooking rice. Eventually it became bath beans, which is, you know, AKA soap old soap. Some bath beans were loaded with ingredients, much like the bath bombs we can find today, so they were all quite unique. You could make your own little bath bean. Number seven, purple nut sedge weed. Archaeology is fascinating. And no, I'm not just talking about dinosaur stuff. They look at rocks and be like, ah yes, a Viking was here thousands of years ago and he was a Libra. How do you know that? This is so impressive. Ancient sites tell a story, and Karen Hardy, an archeologist with the Catalan Institute for Research and Advanced Studies at the University of Barcelona, she found another ancient hygiene practice while studying a prehistoric site in Sedan. Plaque, turns out, can last thousands of years. It calcifies once it mixes with food, then after it's stored below the gums, game over, it's there for good. Specifically, thousands of years ago, it's, it was there to stay. We couldn't really get that out. Hardy was studying remains that were two to 9,000 years old, and in their teeth, they found traces of pollen, dirt, and plant fibers. More specifically, they found evidence of a plant called purple nutsedge. It contained lysine, which is an amino acid that we need to live, so although it didn't taste the best, it sure was vital. Ancient Egyptians used the root for perfume, but this new study shows that purple nutsedge may have been used to prevent tooth decay. They would just chew on roots all day to take care of their teeth. The plant produces antibacterial chemicals, so chewing on them would have been beneficial. Little different than the inside of a tortoise, I'd say. It's definitely a step in the right direction. Number six, smoking. Back in 1665, during a plague in London, you were told to smoke cigarettes because they were considered disinfectants. Sore throat, and eh, smoke this pack of cigarettes. I'm sure that'll help. Help you cough a bit more, if anything. We mentioned before tobacco smoke enemas in like part one or two or three or something over there. But this is just bad advice. Since mouth to mouth wasn't a thing in the 50s, if you were trying to save a drowning victim, you would also have to blow smoke in their face or their butts. Either way, how insane is that? Can you imagine that actually playing out in real time? He's not breathing, quick. Hang on. Cut to 1964, turns out smoking is bad for us. Who knew? Cigarettes were labeled as deadly going forward after that point. It's pretty intense now though, eh? The photos on cigarette packages now are haunting to look at. I still think teenagers smoking to stay in shape is a bit scarier to be honest than that image. She's always like, <sighs> her face is just like pulled, so scary. Don't smoke. Number five, 
dark dental days. Dental health is important. We have the charcoal toothpaste trend that I myself even hopped onto recently, but why are we even doing it? Do we know, other than it's on TikTok? Well, it helps remove stains, but aside from that, there's no hard evidence that this is the next best brushing method. We do it because it's popular. It feels like we're missing out on something. Well, Queen Elizabeth the first apparently had a pretty strong desire for a Mars bar too, but back in the day, they didn't have TikTok. Brushing wasn't cool, nor was it perfected in any sense. The queen's teeth became riddled with cavities. Her teeth straight up began to rot and subsequently turn black. But seeing as she's the literal queen, people wanted to be just like her in any way. She started a short-lived trend where women blacken their teeth on purpose just so they would appear rich enough to afford sugar. That's wild. That's like me walking around in a neck brace being like, oh yeah, I crashed my Lamborghini. I totally have one of those. Number four, arsenic. I think they were confusing this chemical with Accutane, which is a chemical we use today to treat acne. But for a while, arsenic wafers were used. Yes. The poison, arsenic, the thing that would kill you. Yeah, that one. In the 19th century, arsenic was marketed as a safe way, safe way, to effectively clear your skin. It also claimed to restore a youthful complexion that we as humans always long for. Now, it did create a very pallid complexion, but not because it was restoring the gift of life, but because it was killing off the consumer's blood cells. Yay! It also cleared acne pretty well, but it also created a dependency on the product. If the user discontinued using the wafers, then the acne would return even worse this time. Therefore, it would create a vicious cycle of slowly poisoning oneself to death because you'd have to go back on it so you'd look hot. I don't know. Number three, the trico system. Instead of plucking your eyebrows before prom or getting waxed head to toe like we commonly do so today, back in the 1920s, you needed the trico system to remove any unwanted hair. This device was booming in the 20s. Hair salons just had to have this machine. I'll call it machine. It was changing the game. By 1925, there were over 75 systems installed in beauty shops. And what you would do is you would sit at this large desk, face a tiny small window, and for a few minutes, you would just be beautiful. Just 20 simple treatments of this radiation beaming off your face and then bam, you're beautiful. What's, what's the trick you ask? Radiation. They didn't know this yet. It was dangerous. They didn't know much at the time, but this thing was chock full of radiation. They used x ray technology on their bare faces. That's like when you go to the dentist and they click the thing and then they run into another room. This one, they're like, just right there. No sheet, no metal, heavy thing, just face to face. Now I'm hot. So in 1929, trico problems were on the rise. Ulcers, carcinoma, keratosis, death, just everything bad. This was not the solution you wanted, but you know what? At least you were hot. Sorry, gents, this isn't for you. Number two, moss. Okay, I'm not the only one who has asked this question in their minds. Periods. How in the heck did we deal with them without pads, tampons, diva cups, and my doll? I don't know. How? Well, <laughs> it doesn't look good, folks. It took a lot of trial and error to get us where we are now. The first disposable pads only came onto the market in 1888. Like, ugh, what? Even earlier prototypes of menstrual cups were made out of aluminum or hard rubber. But you may be surprised to learn that moss was a common resource. Yeah, the thing you see on rocks and trees. Cloth and cotton weren't enough, so they resorted to using moss to help absorb ant flow when she came by. It could have been grabbed from anywhere. Although we know that moss isn't the most hygienic of materials, as it could be grabbed from anywhere, as I just previously stated, a rock, a tree, who knows? Physicians believed it had antiseptic properties. They even used it on the battlefield to stem the flow of blood. Menstruation at the time was considered a sign of witchcraft, even though it happened every month. Poisonous and dangerous at the time. Okay, I know desperate times call for desperate measures, but like, they reused it. They didn't throw it out after. Ugh. Ugh. And finally, number one. Roman toilets. When I go to the washroom, number two, whatever, that's my time. I'll straight up hold it for like three business days until I get home. It's called a bowel movement for a reason. It's a movement, it's an event. I need isolation, quietness. These poor Romans, I mean, thank you for inventing the toilet and all, that's really, great and dandy, but I feel very bad for the first group of individuals that had to use these stone benches. The early OG toilets. God, that looks so cold. Also, I guess stalls, like walls, they weren't invented until much later. Couldn't have thrown up some Bristol board, you feel us? I don't want to be shoulder to shoulder with a guy who accidentally gulped uh, some public spa water hours prior. And don't even worry about wiping also, because that wasn't invented until much later. You just do the old scrape, do the old stone cold scrape off the bench and then call it a day. Give this video a Roman thumbs down if you're glad for toilets. That means thumbs up.
Number 10, not bathing. Let's start off strong. So obviously hindsight is 2020. We know a lot of more about personal hygiene now than we did, you know, then and as well in like middle school because high school locker rooms, what the heck. Without the knowledge of germs and disease, not bathing seemed like the logical next step for a lot of people, even though it made you smelly as all heck. When the pilgrims arrived in Native America on the Mayflower, the indigenous tribes often referred to their horrid smell. An account from a member of the Patuax Nation even tried to convince them to start washing themselves. They were like, come on guys, it's enough. They washed their hands and faces, but they rarely washed their whole bodies. Though they believed cleanliness was next to godliness, that didn't necessarily mean they needed water to do it. They believed that should they submerge themselves, they risk disease. This could be because they dumped their daily duties into the water, so you know, that's that's likely. So instead they took dry baths where they wiped themselves down with a dry cloth. But this, that it, it didn't really help much. Number nine, bedpans. It's always the worst when you get tucked in at night, you start to fall asleep, you're starting to doze off, and then you realize you need to pee. It's the worst, you gotta get up, walk down that long scary hallway, blind yourself for two minutes, and then get cozy all over again. Well, in the middle ages, you would just toss your full bedpan out the window. Easy peasy, heads up, oh, oops, <laughs> it's so gross. Or sometimes, if you were feeling a little lazy, this was also common, you would use the bedpan and then just slide it back underneath your bed and go right back to sleep. If anybody ever gives you shit for having cups in your room, show them this video, show them this history. You're fine, you're not that bad. Back in those days, we weren't exactly aware of the disease that we threw out the window as well. Most of the time it was number one, so the rain could just, you know, wash away the yuck. But these buildings were only one story. There wasn't, it wasn't going anywhere. If you were tossing anything out, you'd be stepping over it the next morning on the way to, you know, the public execution or whatever. Number eight, a lead facial. Today, if you have tan skin from that hot summer glow, it implies that you have had enough leisure time to acquire such a hue. Getting a tan is the thing, unless you're like me and slather on that sunscreen for health and so you look like a newborn baby when you're 80 years old. However, it was the opposite in times of old. If you had sun-kissed skin, that meant you worked hard in the fields, a symbol that you were a peasant or of lower class. If you were rich, you tended to have much paler skin, therefore implying your status. But simply staying out of the sun wasn't enough. Elizabeth I used a combination of lead and vinegar to achieve a bright white complexion and to hide her smallpox scars. The compound was called ceruse. This tradition even goes all the way back to women in the Roman Empire. Empire. A well known actress named Kitty Fisher was also said to have died from the material as it slowly poisoned her with daily use. The material would add blisters, so she put more on to cover it up. Same with Elizabeth, and yes, yeah, slowly you understand. Number seven, Victorian laundry day. You spill some mustard on your shirt today, that stain will be gone by the time you get home. We're pretty advanced when it comes to quick stain removal today, but like the Romans, which I'll talk about later, it wasn't always smooth sailing. Take the 18th century, for example, when laundry day came around, it was an event. It was like an ultimate chore. They had to take daylight in consideration and plan their washing days, as in more than one. The Victorian era was exhausting. They would soak their clothes overnight, then the next day would be spent soaping them up, boiling them, rinsing, soaping again, rinsing again, maybe soap one more in case you know there's too much pee pee, and then rinsed another time, wrung out, mangled, laid out to dry, hence the sunlight timing, starched and then slowly ironed. Cut to today, we have to encourage adults not to eat Tide Pods or drink bleach. We'll get there, maybe, I don't know. Number six, wigs and makeup. When you don't bathe, and are overall just smelly, you're gonna need to do something to cover up whatever the heck is building up beneath that bodice. Wigs would have never become as popular if it weren't for a very specific venereal disease called syphilis. By 1580, the STD was the worst epidemic since the Black Death. Patients clogged hospitals and without antibiotics or protection, things got pretty nasty. Sores, blindness, rashes, dementia, and patchy hair loss. Thus, for the sake of keeping up appearances, wigs came into fashion. Also the makeup I mentioned before. Balding was a huge humiliation, so they made wigs out of horse, goat, and or human hair. They also cover the wigs in powdered, scented with lavender or orange to hide any foul odors, and as we suspect, there were a lot of foul odors. They weren't stylish until 1655 when the King of France started losing his hair and had 48 wigs made. Then five years later, his cousin Charles II of England joined the train and suddenly powdered wigs became like the next best thing. Wigs did help curb the lice problem though because the human hair had to be shaved in order for the perukes to be worn, but the wigs themselves had to be deloused often. 
and yeah. Number five, Crocodile done the deed. Again, I'm saying this again, who had the gall? Who had the damn audacity to look at a steaming pile of, of digested animal excrement and go, you know, that will work for Insert problem here. Once again, I put the question, how the heck did we survive? But nevertheless, we are here once again to bring to you yet another animal poop cure-all. And this time it was for contraception. Yes, in ancient Egypt, women would use crocodile dung as a contraceptive. Yay! Now, crocodiles were worshipped and sacred to the ancient Egyptians, so that could be one reason why they thought it would help. They would mix it with sour milk. Sour milk? <sighs> to make it a pasty kind of poop dough with a hope that would create an acidic barrier to sperm. Kind of like a dungy version of a diaphragm or a cap used today, but covered in spermicide. We had to start somewhere, but I honestly can't think of a better way to kill the mood. Hold on, honey. Gotta shove some poop out there. Number four, sulfur for freckles. Ooh, this next one gets me hot. This next one just hits too close to home. Sorry, frecklers. I love my freckles. Every summer they pop harder and harder, better, faster, and stronger. I love them. But back in the day, there were some pretty insane methods to get rid of them. I know, get rid of them. How could you, right? How dare you? Having freckles in ancient Roman days meant you couldn't participate in your favorite magical rituals. <laughs> Yeah, sorry Balthazar, I'll catch the next meeting I guess. I'm gonna go wash up. Having freckles meant you were impure or polluted. And in ancient Greece, having a beauty mark or a thousand on your face or cheek meant a bright future was in store for you. So, depends really where I am, but kinda, I'm like, huh? Medieval Europe, moles or freckles meant that you were for sure a witch. Great. That one, they're kinda, they're, they're onto something a little bit. They got witchy vibes. Ancient China, if you had a red or black mole, that was actually a good sign. But a brown mole, like this one, meant grave warning signs. E. So depending where and when you were, that freckle that you named when you were seven could have possibly changed your entire life. In places where freckles weren't desirable, sulfur was used daily to get rid of them. We don't recommend lathering your face with sulfur. In fact, I think magical rituals are safer. Number three, Versailles and other palaces. Did anyone else imagine when they were a kid that they were born in the wrong era and should have been like prouncing around in golden embroidered gowns and palaces or being in a masquerade decked in velvet across the room from your secret lover? <sighs> Some more than most. Except there is a lot missing from that fantasy, specifically the smell. You'd think a place like Versailles with like halls of mirrors and lots of gold everywhere would be like the cleanest place to live in the 18th century, but the reality was stomach churning. Remember that red velvet dress? Well that hadn't been washed in god knows how long and you were stuffed in a room with people wearing the same thing and everywhere was a toilet. That's right, nobles didn't wait to empty themselves in a chamber pot or bathroom of some kind. Versailles was their toilet. They would relieve themselves in empty fire pits, imagine if it was occupied, in the stairwell, behind doors, wherever they felt. Sounds too ridiculous to be true? <laughs> well, take this 1675 report of the Louvre Palace in Paris and I quote, on the grand staircases, behind the doors, and almost everywhere one sees, there are massive excrement, one smells a thousand unbearable stenches caused by calls of nature, which everyone goes to do there every day." Unquote. Things got so bad in other palaces, Henry VIII even had to decree that cooks in the royal kitchen were forbidden to work naked. Why were they working naked? I don't know. Or in garments of such vileness as they do. So as for my first point, I think I was born in precisely the right era. Number two, finger food. You ever go to somebody's house for dinner and they have like 15 forks laying in front of you, just way too many utensils for no reason. That's why I like nachos, okay? It's not intimidating. Burgers aren't intimidating. You can just eat with your hands and get messy. It's easier. It's way more fun as well just to dive in and make an absolute mess. Like medieval times, for example, they had cutlery, but you had to be somebody fancy to have it. Most of the population, being poor and all, had to eat with their hands. Chopsticks were first used during the Shang Dynasty, the oldest chopsticks ever found went as far back as 3000 BC. But come 400 AD, China's population spiked, resulting in a lack of resources for food. These stirring sticks now got a lot smaller to fit for their smaller portions, and that was the start of chopsticks. Fun fact. Come the 16th century, the rich and fancy carried their own set of forks with them to their royal dinner. King Charles V of France had a vault 
a vault with a few forks in it. He's like, hey, check this one out. Bing. That's how rare that kind of metal work was back in medieval times. I bring plastic forks to work. Does that count for something? I have like two in my backpack, maybe three. Number one, and last but not least, a gong farmer. Adding to that fantasy I spoke about earlier, living in a castle with a glistening, sparkling moat. What moat could you want? Well, I'm sorry to say that moats often doubled as toilets. Very often when castles were built, the toilets would be built high up in the castle hanging over the moat so that it would just drop right in there. But another way they would deal with their droppings was to build a toiletry over a cesspit, kind of like an outhouse, or kind of exactly like an outhouse. Except at one point, the cesspit would fill up, enter the hero of the hour. Today, we have people with machines who do it, Somebody actually had to go in there and do it himself with their bare hands. Friends, remove your hats in honor of the gong farmer. Their job was to get on in there, shovel it out by hand, and ferry it to a spot where they could bury it. It was a dangerous job for a multitude of reasons. The top ones including the pits were often riddled with disease, and they were often quite deep. So as a result, they were paid very well for the time to sweeten the fact that no one would go near them, so they would be forever alone. But even then, lives were lost. One man by the name of Richard the Raker fell into one and drowned. What a way to go. Kicking off our list at number 10, seam squirrels. I love squirrels, being Canadian, we see quite a bit of them. They're a little too friendly for me at times, but they're great. During the Old West era, seam squirrels were, well, not what you think. Personal hygiene was not a priority for many people back then, obviously, and lice infestations were unfortunately quite common. Now, the type of lice that affected people during this time was commonly known as body lice, which is pretty horrible. That could be found in the seams of clothing, hence the term seam squirrels. Yeah, not actually a squirrel at all. It's just body lice. Gotcha. Body lice, of course, was a major problem during the Old West era, and they were responsible for the spread of diseases like typhus, trench fever, and relapsing fever. Relapsing fever? I haven't even heard of that one. That's terrible. These diseases were often fatal because, you know, ye old West, and many people in the Old West succumbed to them. To combat the spread of lice and the, you know, one of many diseases that they carried, people in the Old West often resorted to extreme measures, such as burning their clothing or even shaving their heads completely. That's why you see old cowboys and they look like they're stressed. They have no hair. Their clothes are just gone. You're like, what happened? Lice. Lice happened. Some people also used remedies like vinegar and kerosene to try and kill the lice. So yeah, it was a rough time either way. Overall, lice infestations were a significant health concern during the Old West era, and they played a significant role in the spread of disease. Yeah, it wasn't just rats in the medieval era. It was also lice, which is even grosser in my opinion. Number nine, Old West Dental. I could use some Old West Dental recently. I got a, I'm chewing on one side right now, you know what I mean? In the Old West, dental hygiene was not a priority for everyone. They couldn't afford it. And also, dental care was often very sparse. You couldn't really find it anywhere, for that matter. People generally didn't have access to modern dental tools or products, and many did not have regular access to any dentists at any point in their life, which is a sad but real fact. That would suck. I'm terrified. However, there were some basic dental hygiene practices that people in the Old West may have followed to keep their teeth, you know, somewhat in their heads, you know? keep their gums not rotten. Didn't do much, but did something. There were toothbrushes. Not many, but you know, wasn't as good as Oral-B. There was some stuff. More often than not, you'd have to use twigs or chew on mint, that kind of natural survivor stuff. Some people may have also used a cloth or a rag to rub their teeth clean. Yeah, don't forget your tooth cloth before you go on vacation, I guess. You gotta and put it back in your pocket. Your old woody teeth, gotta rub those. Access to professional dental care was limited in the Old West. Some towns, some had dentists, but all they did back then was just pull out the problem. They didn't give you a crown. They're like, which one hurts? All right, get out of here. All without anesthesia. So that's a great time. You're gonna remember all of it. Other options included a community toothbrush, which is hilarious to think about and also so sad. Yeah, some public establishments had a public toothbrush. Can you imagine? Go out, have a little brush, check your teeth. All right, cool. I'm gonna go back to the bar. I'm gonna be sick. I'm gonna actually throw up right now. Number eight, no spitting. Spitting was a common habit back in the Old West. You see it in movies and parodies. They're always spitting on the ground and stuff. Well, it's because it's real. It's a real fact right there. It wasn't a 
officially outlawed. However, many towns and cities did prohibit spitting on sidewalks and inside of public buildings, because yeah, please don't do that. Thank you so much, sir. This was largely due to concerns about hygiene and of course, like I said earlier, the spread of disease. In addition, spitting was considered rude and uncivilized behavior. Yeah, of course, and many people were offended by it. Middle of conversation, guy just spits in between your feet. I'm like, wait, don't do that. Please don't do that ever again. Some businesses even had signs asking customers to not spit on the floor. Can you imagine what kind of sh hole you're in? You have to ask people not to do that. There was also social norms in place that discouraged spitting in certain situations. For example, it was considered impolite to spit in the presence of a woman or in formal settings, which, yeah, I agree, still do that today. That's great. Despite these efforts to discourage spitting, it remained a common practice among cowboys, miners, and other workers in ye old west. They're like, yeah, I have shit in my mouth. I don't know, we don't have water. I'm gonna spit, sorry. Number seven, communal towels. Ugh, this one's so rough. It's exactly what you think it is. It was a ride. Today, we have paper towels that you pump like 13 times just to get a little sheet. Or sometimes, if you're lucky, that Dyson air drying thing where you just dip your hands in for like 13 seconds and then it's done. You're like, oh, the future is here. That's always fun, that one. Back in the old west, communal towels were often used in public restrooms and other shared spaces. Yeah, just one towel for all, just a dap off everything that's wet or damp back then, ew. These towels were usually made of cloth and hung on a rack for multiple people to use just in public, like it's your bathroom. While this may seem unhygienic by our modern standards now, it was a common practice at the time. So yeah, I don't know, we can laugh a bit, I guess. People were generally less concerned about the spread of germs and diseases back then, and communal towels were convenient and they were a cost-effective option for public spaces. However, with the rise of awarenesses about hygiene and germs and all that nasty stuff, the use of these towels Towels eventually fell out of favor in the earliest 20th century. Thank God. Imagine dapping off your lips after eating some wings with a communal towel. Some cowboy just, you know, huh, and then he, huh, and then, huh, 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 and then you come in and wipe your, that's so gross. Number six, hair care? Yeah, I added a question mark there because, I don't know, not much TLC going on on top back then. Throughout history, people have used a variety of natural ingredients for hair care. Nowadays, guys have it too easy. It's like Axe five in one. It's like hair, armpits, legs, feet, all in my, like, no way you can do all of that. Popular methods in the Old West were whiskey and castor oil. Yep, all on your big exposed head, right in the sun, there you go. Pantene Pro-V wasn't a thing then, so folks were rubbing their heads clean with castor oil, that's a nightmare. Whiskey was believed to help cleanse the scalp and often promote hair growth, while the castor oil, that option, that was thought to moisturize and condition the hair, so that'd be a fun two-in-one back then, that's great, put that in the stocking. These ingredients were readily available and most importantly, they were affordable, making them popular, but also realistically, it was their only option. Guys doing whiskey, he's like, yeah, let's clean it up, clean up top. It's so hot. It's like, ugh, really burns. Number five, cesspools. Ooh, gross transition. If you're gonna make a massive castle, you need to know where to build certain rooms. Like say over a cesspool, for an example, that might be important. Just plug your nose. Cesspools were often placed under floors, which makes sense, because you know, you, you poop and then and gravity and everything goes down. But you need to make sure that those floors are supportive enough because in 1183, the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire had a dinner in the palace of Erfurt, but the floor in the main hall broke open, resulting in a bunch of dinner guests falling through the floor, with a few of them even drowning in that cesspool. What a horrible way to go. Then again, in 1326 England, Richard the Raker had just sat down for dinner, guys hadn't even started his meal yet, and then again, the floor broke and he fell through and drowned. I'd say chamber pots were safer, definitely, but when it comes to waste, honestly, just out of sight, out of mind. Just get that away from me. Literally, pun intended. Number four, towels. I'm pretty picky when it comes to towels. I always have to have way too many just ready to go at all times. You know, in case I want a bath, in case I want to have two baths in a row, you never know. Today we have nicer towels at hotels than anything, honestly. We all know somebody with a Bahia Principe resort towel in their closet, and you're like, really? Really, you thief? Okay, I'm telling. Around the 1800s, flour sack towels were the best you'd get. Now, around this time, suppliers were packaging flour and other foods in these cotton sacks. This saved big time on barrels, and eventually they were cut into tea towels. Now, come the Great Depression, resources were of course limited, so these flour sacks were used now for multiple reasons. Clothing, toys, quilts, pillowcases, diapers, and of course, towels. Wouldn't feel too good on your back, not at all. Number three, same clothes, new day. King James, and no, I don't mean LeBron, I mean King James VI of Scotland this time around. We'll talk about him another time. He had a pretty sweet idea when it came to changing clothes. You don't, simple as that. What a dream, right? The amount of times I change my shirt every day for literally no reason, it's such a waste of time. It's like black, 
Mm, gray? Mm, black, yeah, that's it. It's a waste of time. King James would wear the same clothes for months at a time, even wearing the same hat for 24 hours straight. He was devoted to the hat game. He just slept like, didn't move a muscle. He went as far as not bathing either because he thought that it was bad for his health. Yeah, things were thought differently back then, as you may have known by now on this channel. James became king when he was just 13 months old and he succeeded Mary, Queen of Scots. In 1603, he took over as ruler for both England, Scotland, and Ireland for 22 years. And he looked the same every day. Gotta, gotta love it. Who's committed? Number two, unwanted hair. Pubic hair is a biological mystery, and yes, even after we hit puberty, we still can't figure it out. What are you? What's going on? So far, we believe this is part of our evolutionary history, and it comes from a time where we needed fur all over our bodies, right? Like animals. We evolved to protect ourselves against the cold, and just in general to keep that area, you know, safe. I don't know why I did that sound, but it's safe. So why is it that ancient Greek statues of women are completely hairless? Well, this was a time where if a woman's area was hair free, for some reason, the Greeks symbolized it as being pure. Okay. So in order to be considered pure, you'd have to use razors and creams, pumice stones, methods that were not as smooth as today. What's even more annoying is that men who would grow their body hair out, that was a sign of maturing. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not either of these categories. I can't grow anywhere where I want to. It's just bald, I'm just a bar of soap. Yeah, I'm not gonna use a stone to shave either. Thanks, we'll pass, next. And finally, coming in at number one, acne. Ancient Egyptians and Greeks came up with an interesting method of getting rid of those pimples. Now, reminder, this was long before Dr. Pimple Popper was ever a thing. You ever click one of those videos and you're watching for like 40 minutes? You're like, I'm gonna be sick. Is that yogurt? What is that? Physicians back then discussed these elevated spots with black tops that can plague your skin for four to five years. But by squeezing these mysterious spots, you force out the maggot inside. Yeah, blackheads were called maggots back then, so that's pretty horrible. That's gonna be in my head forever. They would refer to severe cases as maggots that lie in bed of roses, AKA your face, that's the bed of roses. If a physician told me I had maggots in my face, I'd faint. Teeth worms and maggots, like just brush your teeth and wash your face and then avoid all that smoke. These disorders were thought to be human skin taken on the properties of animals, so that's pretty wild. So ancient Greeks and Egyptians would use honey, vinegar, turpentine, and emulsion of bitter almonds to solve that problem. Or what I just do is I just squeeze really hard, yell one curse word, and then wipe the mirror. That's usually how I do it. Number 10, spinning. Two words, chewing tobacco. I am not the only one I know it who made this face while watching Western movies and some grimy guy just like spits into a bucket like poo, some like brownie green slime. In saloons in the old wild west, spitting became so common that it had to be outlawed at one point. Men would spit tobacco onto the floor with spittoons and cups of doors lined the bar. Most of the time, they missed. The job of cleaning them often fell to junior shop assistants, which was a worse job than cleaning a fast food chain bathroom. They essentially became little cesspools of disease, and people got really worried eventually, because no duh, they're spitting all their stuff everywhere. Following the devastating flu epidemic of 1918, plus the constant fear of TB, anti-spitting campaigns were undertaken and it was outlawed. Number nine, shine bright like a diamond. If somebody told you that your face was glowing back in the late 30s, that would be the highest of all compliments. You'd be like, oh my God, thank you. I am not a vampire, but thank you. Thoradia was a beauty product company that made radioactive creams, radioactive powders, radioactive lipsticks, anything to get your glam on, all for the price of radioactive products. It didn't end well. This is insane to me. They took pride in using thorium and radium lead to tone facial tissues and remove wrinkles and all that jazz. And the product was doing so well that it circulated in Italy, Portugal, Romania, Egypt, Belgium, and France, worldwide. It wasn't until 1937 until the French government caught on to these little pesky side effects, some would call. So the radium would literally make your skin glow a bit. That was the pull. That was like the, no way, really? Debit. And alongside the glow, also, you were having insane side effects that would ruin the rest of your life. Maybe that's Paul Rudd's secret. If his jaw starts to fall off, we'll know something's up perhaps. Number eight, the humors. Nope, this is not a joke. Ha ha ha, though it sounds like it. Ever heard the phrase to be in good humor? Well, it goes back to this. I mean, probably, I actually don't know, but it sounds like the two are connected. The four humors were the basis of medical treatment in medieval times. The idea was introduced by Hippocrates all the way back in ancient Greece, which combined ancient science, naturalistic knowledge, and philosophy. The four humors were blood, yellow bile, black bile, and phlegm. They were organized to represent the four elements, the four qualities of cold, hot, moist, and dry, as well as the four seasons and planets. 
if something was wrong with you, then it was because one of the humors was out of whack. If you were depressed, something was wrong with your black bile, for instance. Do I know what black bile is? No, I don't want to ever know. Are you too hot? Well, bloodletting will be the solution for that. The factors controlling your humoral makeup involved sex, age, temperament, and many more. Bloodletting was the most popular way of balancing the humors, and it was assumed to have a relationship with most diseases, from smallpox to pseudoscientific hysteria. What, you horny? Let's bloodlet ya. Number seven, public bathhouse. Okay, this next one, we haven't really moved on that much. We still bathe together, we still do it in like water parks, we swim in pools of pee pee, and then go down slides and burn our back skin off. Ancient Roman, so great, you're like, why'd you have to ruin it? Ancient Roman bathhouses were the older, yuckier versions of these water parks. They also didn't have slides, so. Boo. They would literally spread intestinal parasites in these houses, pools, in these massive rooms with massive pools. The Romans were figuring out sewage systems at the same time, which I'll talk more about later, gladly, but they were also the first to create heated public baths. My above ground pool wasn't even heated, but the ancient Romans were. Now I'm upset. I'm gonna call my dad after this. The archaeology and anthropology department at Cambridge discovered that Romans brought lots of parasites to Europe. Fossilized feces show that these heated, relaxing, rejuvenating bathhouses in your body were all but. I don't mean to undermine the ancient Romans though, it's not what I'm doing, okay? To be fair, they also brought lice and fleas. Number six, no hand washing. I don't know. Believe it or not, washing your hands as a doctor before doing anything was a controversial idea. Today, especially due to the last two years, we all have a tune we sing while washing our hands to ensure we're laughing for like full 20 seconds. We've all done it. But when doctors discovered it was their fault people were getting sick, they didn't rejoice, they got offended. The whole conversation started because of a man called Ignaz Semmelweis. He was studying the differences between two birthing hospitals, one run by midwives, the other by doctors and students. The the mortality rate at the latter was way higher than the other. They were dying from something known as childbed fever, more closely known as sepsis. After a series of trial and error, he hypothesized that it was because the students were touching cadavers and then touching the mothers. He then made them clean every tool in their hands with chlorine solution, literally the best thing to kill germs, though he didn't know that at the time, he just assumed it would work. Well, wouldn't you know mortality rates improved significantly, but when he tried to enforce his findings, doctors were upset they were being blamed for the deaths. He ended up getting fired over it and eventually thrown into a mental asylum near the end of his life. <sighs> Considering what we know now, that's rough. Uhaguro is next. As mentioned in the Heian period, yes again because they were the hygiene and beauty trend setting period of Japan, Japanese beauty products broke free and created a distinct aesthetic of their own. This included the long straight hair, white powdered face, yada yada, and an unusual beauty ideal, the blackened teeth called ohagaro. Now it's usually done for the first time during puberty to celebrate maturity and growing beauty for women. Not to mention the charcoals used for it are incredibly good for your teeth. During Heian, purely black items were considered pure and beautiful, and people wanted to imitate that as much as possible. What's new about that? Make it the model for the Kardashian family. Teeth as black as night were seen as beautiful and remained popular as a beauty ideal until the 19th century. Many Westerners who visited Japan described the practice as repugnant because the Japanese custom disfigured the women by making them intentionally unattractive. Naturally, Westerners didn't even see their women as human beings, just walking baby machines, so they couldn't wrap their pea brains around the concept. A woman's appearance is not always about or for them. Many still can't in modern times. Times. However, many Japanese girls were allowed a relatively large decree of both social and sensual liberty. This social ritual is a celebration of the determination of mature women. And while we're on the topic of teeth, how about dental ablation and evulsion? It's hygiene, it's beauty, it's the deliberate taking out of teeth. Three birds, one stone. In Jamon culture in the Japanese archipelago, dating back 13,000 years to 23 years BP, practice this ritual extensively for ceremonial purposes and during regular of passage. 90% of their population had extracted upper and lower canines and lower incisors, usually when the recipients were between late teens and early 20s. Tooth ablation is explained by the archipelago belief that the body is a physical symbol of membership in social community. It can be shaped by and contributes to its environment, like how seasons change and tides turn, we evolve. Changes in social environment can affect patterns and choices of body modification. As the mouth is the primary social organ, teeth are one of the most visible parts of the body that can display change.
change and thus be treated through some form of modification, chipping, filling, whatever your choice. In layman's terms, life milestones were commemorated by the extraction of different tooth classes. With a flash of a smile, one would know about the individual's family, if they were an adult or not, if they were married, if they had experienced the death of a loved one, or if they had any children. There was no need to ask because your body openly displayed your identity. Pretty cool, right? Since we're on a roll with teeth, let's dive into body modification. A section about Japanese people in the records of the Three Kingdoms, written by Chinese bureaucrat Chen Shao in the late 3rd century, describes how the men of Wa, which is the oldest recorded name for Japan, tattooed their faces and painted their bodies in pink and scarlet. The tradition derived from how they decorated their bodies in order to protect themselves from large fish when diving underwater for food. Tattoos were also present in the indigenous Ainu of Hokkaido and the natives of Okinawa. The women of Ainu, a tribe considered descendants of the Jaman people, bore tattoos around their mouths and the back of their hand. The mustache shaped tattoo around the lips holding symbolic purposes of warding off evil spirits and indicating readiness for marriage and assuring a woman's place in the afterlife. On the southernmost Raikyu Islands, women had the backs of their hands and fingers tattooed to ward off bad luck and get along with their mothers-in-law. The logic being that any woman who can endure that pain could also endure that of having a mother-in-law that annoying. These indigenous Japanese tattoo cultures were outlawed during the Meiji period, however, making this art form a vanishing tradition. To protect heritage, you can actually get these tattoos for free on Oshima Island. Every culture found its way to reuse and reduce. The tosu is an important aspect of the Zen tradition and counted among the Shichidogaran, the seven indispensable buildings found at every Zen complex. Three of these structures, tosu included, are referred to collectively as the San Mukuduo, aka the Three Silent Halls. See, they can put rules like that in because nobody in that place was eating Taco Bell at 2 a.m. So, toilets could be quiet. In earlier times, people in Japan did not consider the toilet to be part of the house. It would always be found in an additional attachment with a specifically designated pair of slippers only meant to be worn while using the toilet. Do not wear them in the house. If you're rich, you had your own. If you're poor, you likely shared with a neighbor. Before the westernization of the country, human waste was tactically used as fertilizers. By emptying number two only cesspits, excrement wouldn't seep into subsoil or flush into rivers that fed our drinking supplies. As was done in the West, and the reason the Westerners were dropping like flies from disease or walking infections whenever they traveled. By properly storing, using, and refreshing it as fertilizer, Japanese also upheld crops the Westerners couldn't. But the people who showered once a year were grossed out by it, so the Japanese folks stopped the cess fertilization. They both mean the same thing. It's beard hygiene. In Japan, there's only one word for facial hair, with the exception to eyebrows, and it's hygiene. Could be sideburns, a mustache, a beard. That's the name for those facial hairs. It it also happens that the word self-deprecation in Japanese is also pronounced hygiene, so we can already feel the direction this is going. From the medieval period to the beginning of the Edo period, if you were a samurai, you had facial hair as it was a symbol of power that made them appear intimidating, solemn, and dangerous. Those unable to grow these butchy symbols of manliness were shunned and ridiculed, like Japan's second unifier, Toyotomi Hideyoshi, who had to crazy glue these things on his face every day, not kidding, Google it. Then, a little into the Edo period, there was a big switch. It was Japan's period of peace, and suddenly, facial hair was viewed as unbridled sign of aggression. So, 17th century law prohibits even those with the lushest of beards from displaying their grandeur, unless you had a facial scar. So, you can either be baby face, or you can give yourself a cool ass face scar and grow an epic beard. Huh? What you choosing? When overthrown, Western fashion came into Japan, and beards and mustaches were popular again. Portraits from this era often have the cartoonishly large ones. It doesn't last long, though, and clean shape and becomes popular again. So why no beard still today? It's hygiene. Quite literally, yeah, but in a non-literal sense and in our definition of the word. Surveys continue to show Japanese people, particularly women, have the opinion that facial hair is correlated with uncleanliness. Kicking off the list at number 10, medieval manicures. You can clip your toenails anywhere you want these days. An alarming amount of people do it on airplanes, apparently. Yuck. But how do we clip those little piggies back in the day? Before modern fingernail clippers were patented in 1875, we have to look to the ancient Romans and how they got rid of those hangnails. Biting them off, of course, that was the best way. That bad habit I'm sure half of you have, as well as me. That was the best way. Boink. Eating the, eating the nails, bad, bad stuff. In 35 BC, biting nails was written as a way of dealing with nervousness. Even back then, anxiety still had, it was a thing, of course. Ancient Greeks had a tool that looked a lot like toenail clippers, but it was actually used for pulling hairs. I'll get into that one a little bit later. It's a bit more intense. Medieval methods for cutting your nails were usually to use a small knife, 
So around the Babylonian age, the newly invented scissors would just do the trick as well. You just gotta have really good aim. They're big, rusty, giant, comedically big scissors almost. Sandpaper was also commonly used as well, and to that, I say, great idea. We still use that today. Number nine, hot pokers. Okay, I absolutely hate this so much. It makes me cringe, and it will probably do the same to you. No wonder people are actually afraid of going to the doctors. Their ancestors had good reason to be. It was pretty much comparable to going to a torture clinic. Yeah. Though I have to say there was some sense behind this one. If you were to receive an injury where the loss of blood could be fatal, cauterizing the wound was a good way to stop it. But it would definitely suck. They would heat up a hot poker and apply it directly to the wound without the luxury of any painkillers. Obviously, this would be extremely painful. Would I rather bleed out? Or have this done? I honestly don't know. However, it would probably result in infection if not treated properly, especially considering that they didn't wash their damn hands as we found out in the previous video. But they wouldn't just use hot pokers for blood wounds, they would also use them to burn off hemorrhoids and STDs and I don't know, hopes and dreams. It was a bad time. Number eight, clamshell hair removal. Whew, here we go. Nowadays you can laser off any unwanted hair. Waxing as well, sounds like an absolute nightmare, but compared to how it used to be done, it's still our best method today. Looking back to around 100,000 years ago, long before Gillette had their nine blade razors with cooling gels and all that good shit, we had to use seashells, literal, Seashells, and when I say seashells, I don't mean they would glide across the skin and you know, Sweeney Todd themselves. No, they would use two shells and then put them together as tweezers and pluck the hairs out one by one. Seashells, can you hear that? It's the sound of our ancestors plucking their eyebrows. They're still screaming. Sharpened clamshells were used later in the 19th century and we realized if they're flat enough, we can swipe them off. So they were sharpening shells. Eventually they got to the gliding technique. Saves time, but still it was horrible. And if that sounds bad, 30,000 years ago, we used flint blades to shave. Yeah, just remember, when you nick yourself, it can always be better. Number seven, mouse skins. It honestly seems like we really can't get our eyebrows right. In the early 2000s, they were plucked within an inch of their life. Today, we have brow pencils, waxing, soap brows, which I really don't understand. Back in Elizabethan times, they were plucked entirely off of the face to make foreheads look bigger. And now there's this trend. Eventually, bountiful eyebrows came back into fashion, and for those women who weren't blessed with such brows, resorted to mouse traps. That's right, in order to get that luscious furry frame above their eyes, they would catch mice, skin them, and apply them to their eyes. Yay. In the 17th and 18th century, more specifically, women of nobility were known for shaving off their eyebrows entirely and stick on the mouse skin. It was better if the mice had really dark fur because the popular look of the time was pale skin and black eyebrows. Gee, I wonder where Snow White came from. But even more hilariously, <laughs> They would place their brows higher than normal so they walked around looking surprised all the time. Imagine one of them receiving the worst news possible while simultaneously looking like they just won the lottery. Also, the glue wasn't very good, so they would fall off at leisure. Your mom died. Oh no, like what the heck? Number six, horsehair dental floss. Yeehaw, okay, despite how annoying dentists can be sometimes, flossing is vital when it comes to mouth cleanliness. But using horses' hairs to do so, that just sounds counterproductive, no? Early human remains were studied and it showed these grooves in between their teeth. So they would sharpen these little sticks on both sides or use horse hair to get those hard to reach places. Even back then, way in ancient times. If it wasn't horse hair, it was thin, long twigs. Honestly, I'd rather use the twigs. At least that has like a scent of some sort. I don't know, like mint, minto green, something like that, horse back? No. It really wasn't until 1815 until a New Orleans dentist named Levi Spear started to use silk thread to floss in between the teeth instead of hair. Thank you, Levi. As fun as horse hair flossing sounds, I'm going to stick to the spearmint. Spearmint. Levi Spear. Wait a minute. Number five, loincloths. Going back to ancient Roman and also ancient Egyptian times, the loincloth was used by all. Either that or you would just be naked. I found this neat step-by-step -step online on how to make your own loincloth, because that's apparently what I do on my free time. Thank you for asking. And it's a bit more complicated than I thought. It's way more 
It's way more complicated than just throwing on sweatpants or even, you know, the towel fold like a toga. This had numerous steps. We don't have a lot of archaeological evidence because these linens barely made it through a decade, let alone all this time, but ancient Romans would use leather to make underwear. That's a fun little fact right there. Hot goat skin wrapped around your waist in the hot sun. We love it. We still use leather today when it comes to undergarments, but I'll let Adam tell you about that one another time. That's more of a... That's more of a home one. Number four, food as medicine. Trying to prevent bad things before they happen, it is a very human skill to have. And when it comes to preventative medicine, the Egyptians had some methods. One more obvious solution is diet. Eating the right stuff truly does help lead to a longer life, but eating the specific right stuff can directly prevent certain issues. As a prime example, the laborers that would build the massive iconic structures we know Egypt for today were kept fed with diets that include a lot of onion, garlic, and radishes. Now, I don't know if the ancient Egyptians knew the chemicals these foods contained, or if they just put two and two together, but onions, garlic, and radishes contain ad why did I do this to myself? Contain allostatin, allicin, and raffinin which are very helpful when it comes to preventing diseases in the super crowded working and living conditions the laborers existed in. That Allison really helps. Another example would be to cure night blindness. In these circumstances, doctors fed their patients powdered liver, which is rich in vitamin A, which is a vital nutrient for vision. Again, I don't know if they knew it contained that specific fang or if they were just like, hmm, I eat liver and I can see better. Discovery! Number three, acne. Ancient Egyptians came up with an interesting method to getting rid of those pimples. Now, this was long before Dr. Pimple Popper was ever a thing, and physicians back then discussed pimples as such. Ready for this? They called them these elevated spots, with black tops that can plague your skin for four to five years. But by squeezing said spots, you force out the maggot inside. Yeah, blackheads were referred to as maggots. That's what they thought they were back then. Imagine your partner, hey, can you get this pimple on my back? Yeah, I think I got some maggots, thanks. No, no thank you, that's pretty horrible. That's a horrible reference. They would refer to severe cases of acne as maggots that lie in a bed of roses. I would faint, I would be so sick. If a physician told me I had maggots that lie in a bed of roses anywhere on my body, I would throw up, I'd pass out, I'd be so upset. Dermatological disorders were thought to be human skin taking on the properties of animals. Yeah, you have common acne, mm, maybe you're turning into a pigeon, who knows? Ancient Egyptians would use honey, vinegar, turpentine, and emulsion of bitter almonds, all to get rid of acne. Yeah, sounds like a horrible alternative. I would much rather just have acne. Maggots? Dude, I'm done with this channel. I'm out of here. That's so gross. Number two, eye makeup. Almost everybody and their mums knows that the Egyptians wore that crazy awesome eye makeup. But what you might not know is that it didn't just serve the purpose of making you look absolutely stunning. No, a lot of these eye makeups were lead-based. Now, that sounds pretty bad, I can't lie. It does, and it likely was for some, but it was possible that it boosted nitric oxide by up to 240% in cultured human skin cells. I don't know what cultured human skin cells means, but that's the quote. If you know, let me know down below. What the heck does nitric oxide do? Well, that I do know. It helps to boost up your immune system to fight diseases, which, guess what? That's pretty important, especially in the marshy areas around the Nile, where eye infections are actually pretty darn common. What's cool is that research suggests the Egyptians actually knew that, and specifically synthesized the makeup for this purpose. Huh, <laughs> neat. Finally, number one, mummification. Back in the day, mummification was common, and even today we're finding more mummies. Like, literally last month, we just unraveled six more. It's crazy. We're uncovering more ancient history, which is great, but how exactly was this process done? We're talking about back maggots and stuff. What, what did they think about this? How did this even begin a, to be a thing? Well, it wasn't cheap. For starters, being mummified was reserved for the rich. It's a pretty brutal process as well. What you would do is you would put a hook, or well, they would put a hook in your nose after you'd passed away, and then they would pull out your brain and all that just squishy stuff, just out all through this thing right here. And then they would cut the left side of the stomach open, remove all those goods, all the organs, boom, see ya, gone. And while those are drying, you would put your lungs and liver in jars. And then you would put the heart back in the body and then you would wash the insides out with wine and spices all that stuff turpentine turpentines all the time and teens just all in there washing it out then you'd cover the body in salt for 70 days that's a long time but around day 40 you would stuff it with sand now come day 70 finally that's when you wrap them in the mummy bandages then the sarcophagus awaits forever really and then there's just jars of organs also stored in your burial chamber 
Now it's, we don't do it, it's not as fun anymore. We don't put our organs in jars. We don't stuff anyone with sand. We should, you know what? We should bring I back mummies. Let's just do should. it, I think it's time. Yeah. Kicking off the list at number 10, pig toilets. Yeah, we'll start off with a nasty one. Look, we're on the part six now. We're talking about some ancient hygiene practices. It's gonna get gross, it just has to at this point. I've talked about Roman toilets, horsehair dental floss. So now we gotta dive into some yucky stuff. Pig toilets began around 200 BC in China and these pig toilets were actually pretty common. You would just go to the washroom over top of a pig pen. It's pretty straightforward, it's pretty awful, but also it's all they had. It's pretty awful, but I would say it's worse for the pigs, definitely worse for the pigs. The pigs would eat the waste because it was mixed into their food, they couldn't tell the difference. Ugh, horrible. This was one of the few options to manage waste, especially in areas where plumbing wasn't possible. I talked about pigs going to court in your recent Bumblebee video. If I was a pig, I would be pressing charges left, right, and center after this. That's so disgusting. We're at number 10 and I want to puke. Nice, buckle up. Number nine, water closets. This one sounds fun. A closet full of water. What a blast, pun intended. Back in the 1800s, all over Europe, our modern day version of the bathroom came to life. Thankfully, I'm very glad this happened. If it didn't happen, it'd be, it'd be a little bit different nowadays. It takes two things to have a water closet. A home big enough for a room purely devoted to waste, which is amazing. And of course, running water, that definitely helps. Sir John Harrington, godson to Queen Elizabeth I, was determined to invent what we now know as the basic toilet. Back in 1596, he created this idea, and people actually made fun of this guy for spending so much time working on a useless device. Yeah. The more we know. Cut to 200 years later, another inventor by the name of Alexander Cummings reworked the water closet, added an S trap, the little valve between the top and the bottom parts of the bowl, and now we're on the right track. Then a couple years later, in 1777, Samuel Prosser applied for a plunger closet patent and got it. A year later after that, Joseph Brama enters the toilet game, adds a valve on the bottom, an old school ball cock. So we're getting there, slowly over time. Different inventors are bringing their new ideas in, all so that we can go and take a Brahman was a sailor at the time, so his water closet was often used on ships of that era. Today we have toilets that flush automatically. Once you get up or move around, the sensors think you're done, and then they blast away. If you stand and wipe, good game. This thing's gonna be making noise all day long. Number eight. Bald face. In another video on things too woke for this era, I talked about how it was once cool to have no hair on your face at all. I can't grow any facial hair, so this is this reaches out to me. This is good, I like this. I like punching in on this fact. Well, Queen Elizabeth I was the first to bring this idea into Western culture. She influenced women to completely pluck their eyebrows, and on top of that, they would also shave their hairline back as far as they could, so their faces would be as large and as big and bright as possible, just right there, like the big moon, just it was common for women to soak bandages in a mix of ammonia, vinegar, walnut oil, all to hopefully, hopefully suppress the hair growth on their forehead. Facial hair was removed, but body hair, that was left untouched. The Catholic Church also influenced the look. Growing your hair out was a feminine display until you went out in public and had long hair. Then it was immodest. Because, of course, number seven, blowing cloths. Okay, I have to adjust the jeans for this one. Going back to ancient Roman and ancient Egyptian times, the loincloth was used by all. Neat. Either that or you would just be naked. So, you know, if you're a nudist, great. Hit the thumbs up if you're a nudist. I don't know, I don't know why I said that. We're gonna keep going. I found this neat step-by-step -step on the internet how to make your own loincloth. And it's a bit more complicated than throwing on sweatshorts and calling it a day. We don't have a lot of archeological evidence today because these linens barely made it through a decade, let alone all this time. But ancient Romans would use leather also to make underwear, which is, just imagine that, I'm like, ha, ah, it's hot. Hot goat skin wrapped around your waist in the sun. We love it. We still use leather today when it comes to undergarments, but we'll save that talk for another time. Number six, breast bags. There's a neat term, breast bags. Let's bring that one back, see if it sticks. Now, contrary to what I just explained over at point number seven, women, more often than not, didn't wear undergarments in the Middle Ages. Up here, at least. But in 2008, at Austria's Langburn Castle, something that resembled a modern day bra was discovered. It's believed that only higher ups, ladies of nobility rather, were the only ones who had the privilege to wear these breast bags or breast cups. I say breast bags, sounds a little funnier. We have bags of milk in Canada, so you know, connecting the, yeah, that's, that's, I gotta connect the jokes. I can't say much personally, but this does not look supportive enough at all. It's like a pirate flag, it's like ripped apart, this is nothing. If you have back problems, I don't think these breast bags are gonna help you. If you're ever catching up on some 13th century readings, well, now you have an image when you see the word breast bag. This, this eye patch that they called support. Nice. Number five, bread and entertainment. Hygiene is health, and health is mental health. And that means after a long day, you need entertainment. 
That's why you came here, hopefully. They say that after bread comes entertainment. I feel the same. Where would my generation be if not for the ability to rewatch The Office infinitely? Aztecs had been theatrical killers, sure, but they also had a soft spot for the arts. During their crazy spring cleaning festival to save the world, you may just find the Aztecs enjoy music and poetry. Some of the poetry even survived the downfall of the Aztecs and is around today. I'd recite it, but I would need some help from Chris to help sound things out. I wonder if they had a poem for a stranger that comes from a faraway land to take all our golden riches away. Hmm. Number four. More than one way to skin a cat. Here I am talking about Aztecs, and that means I gotta talk about how bloodthirsty they were. Seriously, it's good they washed their hands because with the amount of blood on them, well, I don't have a joke for that, they just kind of got crazy with it. It's estimated that 20,000 people a year perish to sacrifice. That's that's way too many, dude. That's that's wrong. Which, if I'm being honest, those numbers probably could have helped you fight off the Spanish when they, they came to take everything. What do I know? Cutting the heart out of people while they were still alive, a lot of heads no longer attached to bodies, and something that's just so heinous. Texas Chainsaw fans rejoice because the Aztecs loved a good skinning. Just a good old fashion peel skin off them. Just take it off, George. George, take your skin off. I don't know why Jerry Jerry Seinfeld skinning somebody, but sure. What do they do with the skins afterward? Do they throw them into the crowd and they cheer it on? Or, cause that's, that, that's just wrong, man. That's not right. That's wrong, bruv. The chief was so upset by this one that he had nothing to say, actually. The chief is speechless. He's got nothing. Number three, multiple wives. The act of doing the deed in the bedroom can be messy sometimes. It happens, a lot of passion. And keeping that area on your body and in your life clean is important. Or so says my sixth grade health teacher. I don't know, I wasn't paying attention. But you gotta think back in the day how sometimes keeping that area fresh it was difficult, especially because we have no self-control and we went a little crazy with it. Take for example that having multiple wives was a status symbol. And let me tell you something, they weren't sitting around waiting for the new season of Stranger Things. They were doing as they do on the Discovery Channel. Number two, get your money right. Any good accountant will tell you that treating your portfolio like good hygiene is a good idea. Go for multiple smells or invest in multiple things. Check out what's on the market. Might be a new perfume, maybe a new stock. And while you're at it, dump a huge investment into fart bucks. Okay, well, maybe not that accountant, but believe it or not, the Aztecs were great accountants and had good records of pretty much everything, which is unusual because most cultures in Mesoamerica just just didn't. And with the amount of gold and riches that the Aztecs had accumulated over time, it was kind of necessary. So you can understand that when the Spanish showed up, they were salivating at the sight of all the treasure that did not belong to them because Hernan Cortez was going to take it. Hand it over, you nice smelling weirdos. Number one, why doubt dude? Through everything the Aztecs went through or did, it all came down to a fever uh, and a cough and many other symptoms, actually. All of their triumphs and losses, all their sacrifices, and all the times they tried to fend off the Spanish. Futile compared to their fight against the sicknesses the Spanish had brought over. Once there was a patient zero, it was pretty much all over. As good as their roots and medical herbs were at healing, ain't nothing gonna cure that black lung. If it can do what it did to a big handsome cowboy, then it can do the same to everyday people. <laughs> Dutch, we got the Aztec sick again, Dutch. I got some chocolate though. Hope you like corn in your chocolate, Dutch. <laughs> Number 10, suck on a clove. Bad oral hygiene was not permitted back in ancient China. Bad breath, even less so. For example, if you were going to be seeing the emperor, it was required that you suck on a clove beforehand to make your breath all nice and fresh, just in case. I think I'm going to use that as an insult. I'm not going to say it again because I feel like, no. Yes, I like this. Other than breath fresheners, the ancient Chinese used primitive toothbrushes made of willow branches that were rinsed clean and then chewed to make all hairy and stuff. And then dipped in some of this tooth cleaning powder made of a bunch of different ingredients like pork teeth, saponin, ginger, cooked remina glutinosa, mulu, eclipta, lotus leaf, green salt, and other things I don't want to struggle to pronounce. Okay. Before that though, they would also use salty warm water as a mouthwash, which would make their teeth more firm and help clean them. I actually do this uh, like every once in a while after I brush my teeth too. It's actually really good for your gums. These ancient Chinese knew what was up. Number nine, bathing. 
In ancient China, the etiquette of a gentleman demanded that he wash his hands five times a day, take a bath every fifth day, and wash his hair every third day. Bathing every day was a bit of a superstitious no-no. Started by northern Chinese societies that would actively avoid cold water or bathing in the winter to avoid getting a cold altogether. And not bathing at all was considered barbaric, like those pesky Mongols who hated bathing and who were hated by the Chinese. Honestly, that part is, is kind of fair. They, they, they kind of sucked. So yeah, to kind of reach a nice midpoint, the norm was to wash once every five days. But that was for the nobility. The common people had access to giant bathhouses where they would go, and I mean, they could go whenever they wanted, really. I shower every morning. I have heard that's bad, but I don't think I'd willingly go for like five days without washing, so I don't know. Maybe I gotta move it to every other day. I, somebody give me advice, please. Let's move on. I, let's just move on. Number eight, rice water. So, the Chinese washed like once a week. That's fine. But how did they wash? What did they use? Well, in the beginning, it was actually common to bathe using rice water as your go-to. It would be used as both body wash and shampoo. The rice water was really good at removing oil and keeping that hair and scalp nice and beautiful, as well as keeping skin nice and silky smooth. The rice water also contains starch, protein, and vitamins that are really good for us. It helped with lower back pain, frostbite, and it was really good to help relieve some of the exhaustion after a long day. Most baths are good at that, honestly. The Chinese also used honey locust that was really good for eliminating dirt and treating rheumatism and ringworm. Both rice water and honey locusts were used for doing laundry as well, with honey locusts keeping clothes unfaded and in good condition. As far as ancient cultures go, the Chinese are already far ahead and we're only on the eighth point. Number seven, threading. Bet you didn't know that hair was not really people's favorite thing in ancient China. I saw somewhere that they even referred to it as thread-like things of troubles. Why the hate? I don't know, but it was part of the reason monks would completely get rid of it. Other people would remove their hair too, and one way of doing that was the practice of threading. A form of hair removal that is still a thing we do today, actually. Now, I apologize if I messed this up, I've never had it done, but threading basically consists of a thin cotton or polyester thread that is doubled, then twisted, and then it's rolled over areas of unwanted hair, plucking the hair at the follicle level. In our modern day and age, it's typically used for eyebrows to shape them and keep them gorgeous. In ancient China, they would use threading to deal with facial hair, which, I mean, I guess eyebrows kind of count as facial hair, so. Threading isn't really opportune for arm or leg hair, though, so it's just a pure facial thing. Good to know. Number six, combs. Yeah, some people didn't like hair, but those who deal with it made sure to keep that stuff nice and combed. Combs were all the rage. A province of China even got the nickname of the Home of Combs, which is a great name. Whether they would be made of wood, stone, or animal bone, many combs were made with care and craftsmanship. Comb shops would open up all over the show, and people would carry combs as accessories. And they'd come in all sizes. Get yourself a comb for the weekends, a large comb to get all your hair at once, a comb to hold your hair in place. Heck, get a comb to help weed out those pesky lice. Number five. Face care. So we've gathered that folks in the Middle Ages didn't bathe often. But when they did, it was just the necessities, right? They didn't have time to, you know, old spice all their stuff up like they do. They had time to dance in the shower and shower backwards. It wasn't a fun event. Hands and face, that's it. That's all you really need anyways. If you couldn't afford a walk-in shower, back in the day, you'd have to invest in an ewer and basin. You would all have to share the same thing and take turns dipping your hands and face in all day long, just the same. Hmm. Protecting your face was vital for ancient Egyptians 6,000 years ago. They would honor the gods with makeup, but at the same time, they would also protect their skin from the sun. We love that. Today we have like SPF creams. I'm like, this is nothing, this is no fun. Ancient Greeks would use oils to clean their face and they would later scrape it off. And in the 1700s, many believed in saunas and sweat cleansing. The number one trick to clear skin, you guessed it, milk baths. Milk is really the name of the game for this part seven, eh, wow. Goat milk mouthwash, milk baths. I'm gonna go milk a cow after this video. Just because, you know? Feels right. Number four, python bile. Yeah, I just said python bile. So if you're eating food right now, I'll, just, I'll, I'll give you a sec, hit that pause button. Not only pythons also, but numerous animals, their bile would be used to treat ailments. Ulcers of the female genital area. Yeah, that's what the doc was giving you. Python bile, have fun. Ancient Chinese physicians would also hand over some elephant bile as well if bad breath was bringing down your game. Elephant bile mixed with water would get rid of halitosis. 
Honestly, any type of bile, just count me out. I just won't brush, how's that? Taylor, why do you have bad breath? Oh, have you seen the alternative? That's why, Mike, that's why. I almost tripped, but that's why. I almost broke my leg. I'm upset about bile. Number three, malaria. Perhaps one of the most bizarre ways to treat one disease definitely is by getting another. If you suffered from syphilis back in the early 1900s, there wasn't really much help you could get. That was until Austrian physician Julius Wagner Joreg came along. He received the Nobel Bell Prize for this discovery, and as bad as it sounds, it's honestly quite the breakthrough. Julius discovered that malaria-induced fevers were the key to treating syphilis. Ye nice. Now we're, I guess, we don't do this anymore because, well, malaria is still horrible and a hefty amount of patients lost their lives trying this method. So no, we at Bumblebee do not recommend this method. We have other ways to treat it now. Number two, rabies. It's a part seven. Let's talk about rabies. Might as well. This is a haunting list so far. Pre-rabies vaccine, I mean, what the hell did we do? Before 1885, that's when French scientists Louis Pasteur and Emile Roux, they developed the first rabies vaccine. We were pretty much SOL if a rabid animal were to bite you beforehand. I mean, one of the leading theories to prevent the spread of rabies was to not let your dog outside while there was a full moon. You know, that middle-aged bull where every remedy just sounds like a side quest in Skyrim, that kind of stuff. Oh, you'll need one egg and two pigeons. I'm like, what? I have, a, I have strep. What are you talking about? In 16th century Europe, it was a literal joke if you had rabies. Doctors quite literally told you to ingest 40 grains of ground liverwurst and wash it down with 20 grains of pepper and a half pint of milk. That's it, that's how you cure rabies. That's how you do it, I guess. You gotta ingest that each morning for four days in a row. Oh, and you also need to have a cold bath every day for a month. Imagine if this really was the only solution, even today. Just cuts to us in 2022 with iPads, technological advancements, we're creating new vaccines, but in order to cure rabies, you still need to slam some milk and have a bath. It's like, yep, yeah, that's the only way. That's the only way we've done it so far. Hygiene history is insane. I'm gonna push for a part eight. Hit that thumbs up so I can keep talking about this nonsense. This is insane. I learn something horrible every day here. And finally, number one, electricity. Electroconvulsive therapy, or ECT, has been around a lot longer than most of us think. It just didn't work back then, you know? Also, we don't call it shock therapy anymore. We're well past that. Tiny electric currents would be sent through your brain, ideally changing its chemistry, and over 1,000 people a year undergo this treatment. But back in ancient Roman times, this procedure, of course, was a little sketchy, just a little wee bit. They would use electric eels. Yeah, they would hang out with a bunch of electric eels to hopefully relieve a headache. Again, I'd rather just have a headache. I'm not trying to become a Spider-Man villain, okay? I just, I'm nearsighted. Today we believe the seizure aspect is beneficial, but back then it was believed that electricity was the key here. We would drink electrified water and wonder why nothing's happening. Number 10, snake eyes. Well, not exactly snake eyes, but after extended use of belladonna drops in the eyes, you would probably wish that a snake bit you in the eyes. Belladonna is poisonous. It's no calzone, red flag but yet it was still used by Egyptian royalty. Basically, the drops of poison would dilate your pupils, and that would be considered to be beautiful for some reason, I guess, okay. Extended use of the drops had terrible side effects for the user, blindness being one of them. You gotta remember, folks this time have no social security, and the best doctors can do for you is tell you to go take a bath in crocodile dung and to pray to the gods for more, I guess. Sure, okay. So to avoid that tragedy, go for the natural look and avoid the eye drops. You'll thank me later. Number nine, more eye stuff. Thought I was done with the eye stuff? Ah, well, guess again, amigo. I ain't done yet. I've got lots more to say about that. Okay, maybe a little. Eyeshadow and eye color. Some ladies today would say no special outfit is complete without it. And honestly, I have to agree, ladies. Sometimes y'all do some stuff with your eyes that makes me say, damn, you look good. Damn, you look good. However, some ladies might be cautious to slap some color on their face if they knew the origins of the product. As for the royalty of Egypt, eye makeup was in. It seemed to be a trend. However, they weren't so cautious of where their makeup got its origins. Egyptian eye glitter had two key ingredients, applicable powder and bugs. Yeah, you know the super colorful ones that are like really big and you wouldn't want to be around? Yeah, those, beetles, scarabs, and pretty much anything you could find. They would then crush them into a heavenly pulp and smear it all over their royal faces. I have issues with spiders and wasps, as it is. I have no interest in wearing them whatsoever. I actually hate wasps. That's just, you mean just crushing up a bunch of, and just, oh, this is good. Oh, I love this. This is the best. Yeah, no, don't do that. Number eight, sweet traps. 
When you're royalty of one of the most successful empires and civilizations in human history, it means you ain't gonna lift a finger. Less than any other celebrities do today, probably. So what to do with all that extra time in your hands instead of living like everyone else? Well, how about a picnic? That sounds nice, actually. Sounds great, right? Except when we bring out all of our favorite treats. The flies and bugs bother us, and we can't look beautiful if we're covered in bugs head to toe. How did the Egyptians fix this, you ask? Well, it's simple. Don't let the bugs bite you in the first place. Basically, you get one of your forced volunteers, maybe a couple, actually, and you slather the poor devils in honey till they look like your favorite pastry from Tim Hortons. Play said glaze serving away from the picnic, and now you can enjoy it in sunshine and peace. The screaming of being eaten alive by bugs might dampen the mood, so just, just wear earplugs, it's fine. Just You stay over there and just get eaten, it's fine. No problem. No problem. Number seven, unhooded Sith. Circumcision is important in a lot of cultures of yesterday and today. Now at this channel, my job is to come out here every week and make you laugh. So to the men out there who still have their Jedi robes, imagine every day of your life you got sand in places that sand shouldn't be. Anakin Skywalker's worst nightmare and honestly explains why he hates sand so much. But perhaps one of the reasons Egyptians used this hygiene service was to stop sand getting in their wiener's one-eyed bandit. There's no showers, nothing to really get it out once it's in there. That's no good. I guess you could take a dip in the Nile River, but uh, there's too many crocodiles in there, and who has the time to jump in the Nile River when they're busy being forced to build large structures that will stand the test of time? So you better line up, fellas, or be cursed to feel like Anakin Skywalker for the rest of your life. The prequel one, too, not the, not the cool animated one, the one that whines a lot. That one. You don't want to be that one. Number six, nice dentist. Turns out not all Egyptian dentistry is completely awful. It turns out they may have come up with the first toothbrush. Other civilizations had examples of one too, so it's hard to tell exactly, but the Egyptians had one. But one thing they did have over everyone else were Tic Tacs, or breath mints, actually. Honestly, this makes a lot of sense. Imagine it was Valentine's Day. You just walked past a large pyramid. There's sand in places on your body where sand just shouldn't be. When you notice the smell of your breath, and it's something awful. But not to worry, because you purchased breath mints from the market. Yes, that's right. Now smooching with your Egyptian sweetheart can go on without a hitch. The mints were made from nice smelling herbs and mints, sometimes roasted over a fire to form little candies. An ancient Egyptian solution to an ancient Egyptian problem. I kinda like that one actually, kinda nice. Gonna put a mint in, it's kinda nice. Number five. Urine deep. Turns out we used pee for a lot of things back in the day, and today we still do? Question mark? The Romans used urine to wash their clothes, and even more impressive slash gross is the fact that they used urine to help with inflammation, burns, or skin disease. Yeah, pee was the number one trick. Get it, number one? I, okay, we'll move on. Best way to whiten that smile was not a crest white strip, but rather a facial mask dip, dipped, dipped in the mellow yellow. Just pee. This is so gross. We mentioned on this channel before that gladiator sweat was once bottled and then sold. Well, their pee as well was sold as this beauty product. Clean out those pores with a drop of Igor. Mm. Get it while it's hot, folks. This is extremely gross, obviously, but it does make sense. The ammonia in urine kicks stains away for good. That's why they would wash their clothes in the same way. Now we get it. History. Gross. Uh, number four, rush plants. Today we use chic shag carpets that, you know, really tie the room together. Sips white Russian. But back in the olden times, they used something called the rush plant to pad their floors. But the thing was, this layer of dense plant material was a breeding ground for nits, ticks, and other creepy crawlies. It was just, it was a really unsanitary situation, but well, like what else were you supposed to do? However, this kind of flooring made them vulnerable to disease and infection. The reason being, as these floors would not be renewed for sometimes 20 years, the bottom layer, left undisturbed, would accumulate a lot of really gross stuff like uh, animal droppings, feces, the piece of grizzle you dropped that one time, fish craps, whatever. So um, it was just not, it was like a, basically a swamp down there. Number three, royal bum. The groom of the stool is a little bit different than the groom of a wedding. It was perhaps one of the worst jobs to have, but, but, pun intended, it's one of the most important roles. The groom of the king's close stool was a position created during King Henry VIII's reign. Their job was to wipe the king's butt. And if that doesn't sound horrible enough, this poor lad would carry the king's stool with him, like on his back, like a Jansport, and then monitor the king's mealtimes, and they would plan their day around when they thought the king would take a shit. 
I would be so anxious if a guy wearing a box toilet was just hanging out near me. He's like, hey, you feeling all right, boss? You good? You feeling full? That was a lot of bread earlier. You sure? All right, take five. Just, I don't know. Just take a look. I don't know. I'll let you be job. You must be thinking, what poor soul got stuck with this job? Well, this job was an honor, my friend. Sons of noblemen were awarded this role. You would get pretty close to the king, I mean, obviously, but as time went on, these grooms became secretaries to that king. Pretty good upgrade. Eventually, getting a higher pay and benefits. Yeah, I would hope so. Even the king's walking, talking toilet gets dental back in the day. How neat is that? Number two, eagle dung. I'm honestly not even sure what to say about this. You know, you have to have some kind of magnificent conviction to be like, I have no reason to believe this is true, but I am 110% sure that bird dung will fix it. Like that's some kind of confidence I don't think I'm ever gonna get. Eagle dung was a common substance found in the birthing room of all places. It was often rubbed in to alleviate the pain, most often accompanied by rose water because who wants to smell that while well, they're bringing life to the world? No one, obviously. Obviously that didn't work and the bacteria from the stuff probably didn't help their recovery either. They also used to place amulets and charms on the stomach to speed contractions and put coriander on the thighs. Coriander was believed to attract the baby out of the womb. A risky move considering people either love or hate coriander. There's no in between. It either tastes like soap or it's the best thing you've ever had. If the delivery was proving difficult, they would open covered doors, untie hair, and perform other metaphors to help the mother deliver easier. But it's the eagle dung that really gets me here, folks. I, I, have, no, I have no excuse for them. Number one, the dirty dead. What feels like a never ending maze, the catacombs under Paris stretch for hundreds of miles. They're a big tourist attraction, obviously, today. Horror movies have been made about these catacombs, just these walls of skulls. But where did they come from? Why were they put there? Also, how bad was that smell? See, originally the tunnels were built for Paris stone mines, but near the end of the 18th century, its purpose started to shift. Cemeteries were starting to pile up, and I mean that in a literal sense, disgusting. There was nowhere to put all these bodies, and everybody else started to get sick because of them, because they were breathing in, you know, dad corpse hot dog breath. They didn't quite know how to handle the dead in a clean way, so they just wanted these bodies out of sight and out of mind. So all these dead bodies that were laying in alleys or on the side of the road, they were gathered and then tossed under the city in these tunnels. These tunnels have been there for centuries before them, so you might as well put them to good use. And by good use, I mean let's just stack skulls in an orderly fashion and terrorize civilians for centuries to come. Beautiful. Kicking off the list at number 10, Kremlu. It's the 1930s, you're looking for a way to get rid of those upper lip hairs. Well, Kremlu promises to have your back. They actually promise to have your armpits as well. Yeah, armpit hair and upper lip hair, gone. For good, you say? Wow, that sounds absolutely lovely. Just don't read the fine print, don't flip it and zoom in. Don't zoom in. This cream was applied to the upper lip, but side effects caused hair loss all over your body. And sometimes users would suffer from paralysis. It was on the market for $10, which back in the 1930s, that's a lot, a lot, a lot. Like for hair removal cream, that's a lot, a lot. Those are like Beats headphones? What is this? The Journal of the American Medical Association called this product out as viciously dangerous. Rightfully so, and those who suffered from those harsh side effects collectively sued the company into bankruptcy come 1932. The silent killer here in the cream was thallium, commonly used as rat poison. That ought to do it. Number nine, ancient birth control. Although birth control today is easier than in ancient times, it's still a chore. It's routine, it's something you have to keep track of daily, and things go wrong if you don't and lose track. There's a plethora of side effects. You have to take fake ones just so your body, what? Your hormones are all over the place. You can get cancer from these, you can get blood clots potentially. There's really, there's very little research on long-term effects for birth control pills. And also, I'm speaking not from experience. There's no birth control pill for guys. This is wildly unfair. I have the most respect. These pills mess you up. My friends will tell me their side effects, and I can't believe it. You're all troopers. Ancient Egyptians, their method of ancient birth control was by mixing acacia fruit with honey and ground dates. This paste would then be used directly, and believe it or not, it was rather effective. Acacia gum ferments and then turns into lactic acid, which can prevent pregnancy. Not all of these ancient methods worked like this. There's another that's really bizarre, and I'll save that for the end. It's absolutely insane. I can't believe it. We'll ease our way there. You know, we'll, we'll start nice. Number eight, Lash Lure. Turning the calendars back to 1933, the year FM radios and drive-in movie theaters were introduced, and as well as the horrifying and deadly mascara, Lash Lure. 
This 1930s cosmetic contained a chemical, P-phenylidamine. That's how you know it's bad, when you can't even pronounce the thing. This mascara left blisters all over your face, your eyelids, the whole thing. It was really bad. There was eventually a death in 1933. One woman sadly developed an infection, a bacterial infection, and then passed away. It was so bad that later that year, her before and after photos were used in an FDA display titled The Chamber of Horrors. It was a horrible incident, but a good way to get the attention from higher-ups, so something like this never happens again. Lash Lure was then the first product in history that was removed from stores entirely, so it worked. We're in the middle of something kind of similar now, I think. Cigarette packages have those horrible side effects to smoking right there on the packaging. The girl with the face. Could we see the day smoking is outlawed? I don't know, I feel like we're close. It's caused quite a few more deaths than Lash Lure, that's all I'm saying. Number seven, bad toothpaste. Doramad toothpaste was advertised in the 1920s. The ad shows a blonde lady with a lovely smile. Some would even say glowing. Right below reads Doramad radioactive toothpaste. Radioactive toothpaste, I've uh, hmm, that sounds bad. I've played enough Fallout to know that radioactive toothpaste probably isn't a great product, especially to put in and around your mouth. It even loudly advertises its radioactive ingredients. Can you imagine this? Increase the defense of teeth and gums. The cells are loaded with new life energy. Good gums don't bleed, they actually glow. That last one I made up, but you can't tell, right? How insane is this? This secret ingredient to shinier smiles and brighter futures was thorium. The god of thunder does not brush with thorium. He uses it to polish his hammer. Yeah, it's very toxic. Number six, Gorad's cream. Once advertised as a magic beautifier, doesn't that sound like a neat time? Gorad's Oriental Cream hit the market back in 1936. This cream was supposed to freshen up your skin, make you look lighter, younger, whatever Paul Rudd's doing, whatever his secret is, we're still trying to figure that one out. That sort of thing. But instead, this skin cream had one user ending up in a book that's very Chamber of Horrors style. This magic ingredient that was meant to magically make you beautiful had some magic mercury in it. Not something you want on your face, yeah, at all. The results were haunting. This woman had soon developed black gums, her teeth loosened, and dark rings appeared around her eyes and even her neck. Mercury poisoning is not fun. Number five, medical shows. Today, medical shows, they're fascinating. Dr. Pimple Popper, I'll watch that all day while I eat. I don't even care, I'm disgusting like that. Dude's getting mashed potatoes squeezed out of their back, so I'm like, ah, let's go, I love it. I'm slapping that thumbs up, it's my shit. Back in the Wild West, the 1860s, the 1890s, you know, they had what's called medicinal showmen. These are, what an absolute joke, what a con. These guys would go town to town selling elixirs and tonics, everything one needs to live a happy and comfortable Western life, but they were full of lies. None of this shit is true. These professional medicinal showmen would have pawns run ahead and plant themselves in the audience before these random demonstrations of amazing medical elixirs, right? These shows, bunch of bullshit. They would call up random audience members, that guy that ran ahead, and then use one of these elixirs and magically treat their ailment on the spot in front of the public, right? Almost as if it was a magic show. One of the most successful of these elixirs was the elixir made from John Healy and Charles Bigelow. It was a mixture of herbs, roots, and animal fat, said to treat any and all illness. But in reality, it was just an extremely strong laxative. So yeah, if you're gonna take it, make sure you're close to home. Yeah. Number four, bad bartenders. When we think of old saloons, old West saloons with the swinging doors and stuff, a few catchphrases and a cowboy with some whiskey, all that good stuff. The bartender back then would pour a drink. The cowboy would take the bottle instead. So illegal, sir, that's that. Please put that back. Back in the wild, wild Western days, grabbing a drink at the bar wasn't like that at all. It wasn't like anything you see in the movies. It sucked. Bartenders, they had no regulations to follow behind that dirty bar. But not only was it very high proof, but some bevy like tarantula juice was just, it would just poison you. It was literal poison. If its name didn't tip you off, it was literally made with poisonous ingredients. Cause that was, that's how cowboys did it back then. But they're hairs. I don't know. Tarantula juice was made from strychnine. If you drink it, you're gonna feel like there's tarantulas crawling all over your skin. That was their pitch back then. They're like, eh, happy hour, come get tarantula juice. I'm like, awesome, thank you so much. How do I not tip? Which button do I press to not give you money, you freak? Number three, grow it out. In the old West era of the United States, men often grew their hair long as a practical choice rather than a cool fashion statement. You know what I mean? All those bandits with their long hair, they had to. Living in the rugged and often isolated terrain of the West, men had to perform many physically demanding tasks like hunting, ranching, mining, pouring whiskey drinks and tarantula juice. 
Long hair would help protect their scalp and neck from the sun and wind and all that good stuff. But it's important to note that haircuts were not always easily accessible back then. And many men back then could not afford them or did not have access to a barber. It's like, I can't cut it. It's like, where? We don't have anything. We don't have dental. What do we do? As a result, growing their hair long became a practical and functional choice for many men back in the Old West rather than, you know, style. And they were going for looks back then. They weren't doing man buns, doing the cowboy thing. They're like, no, I have bugs. I don't want you to see my bugs. I'm going to grow it. Thanks. Number two, outhouses. This one here stinks. In the Wild West, outhouses were sadly common as indoor plumbing was not yet available. They didn't think of that yet. So these structures were often simple and consisted of a small building, if you want to call it that, with a hole in the ground for your your waste disposal, if you want to call it that. Now, due to the unsanitary conditions and lack of proper waste management and knowledge and, you know, knowledge about germs and stuff, outhouses could attract a variety of insects and other pests, and it was just bad to go in there. Flies, mosquitoes, other bugs, they were commonly found in and around these structures, and they could potentially transmit diseases to humans. So, if you're in there, you really get your business done and then get out. You don't want to waste time. You're not checking any tweets while you're in there, that's for sure. Despite the unsanitary conditions of an outhouse, they were a necessary part of daily life in the Wild West. And people learned to tolerate the bugs and just deal with it. Because they're like, you know what? This is better than going on outside. Whatever's going on out there, we're good. Close that up. One time I went to a cottage when I was younger and my mom didn't tell me that they had only an outhouse. No running water the entire week. And I was like, awesome, let's turn around, I guess. I'm not doing that. I held it for like seven days straight. It was a nightmare. And finally, number one, broken bones. I'm lucky enough to have never broken a bone. I mean, knock on all the woods. But what if you did back in the old Western days, right? Then what would happen? But is a cowboy gonna heal you up? No. What if you were trying to learn a kickflip and you broke your leg? Then what? What are you gonna do? If the dental plan was any indication, it's... It's not pretty, not a lot of options. In the Old West, broken bones were a common occurrence, particularly among those who worked in physically demanding jobs, like ranchers, miners, cowboys, around livestock, those things kicking you randomly, something's gonna break. Treatment options were limited and often relied on first aid techniques, you know, splinting the affected area with whatever materials were available, such as wood, cloth, or even animal hides. It sounds crazy, but back then, that was really the only method for immobilizing broken bones. Pain relief, that was only provided with natural remedies, such as oak or willow bark tea, so. You're gonna feel that entire healing process. It's gonna suck. More serious fractures, like ones that, you know, go through the skin, those require the attention of a doctor or a surgeon. However, you know, those medical professionals back then were not always available in the remote areas of the Wild West. No helicopter's gonna come in and grab you and then take you out. No, it's, you're basically fucked more often than not. And coming in at number 10, baths. From bath bombs to jacuzzis, when did people exactly start warming up that cold river water to sit in for some R&R? &R? Well, apparently the Romans were the first to think about warming her up. I don't really know if they had it in mind that warm water works better and faster to clean and rid of microparticles and had more of a oh, mentality, but one way or another they did it. Were they really ahead of their time though? The first bathhouses have been discovered in Rome approximately being built somewhere in the second century BC. The first of its kind from a river of cold water to the abundance of over 500 steaming prominent bathhouses. You could pamper yourself head to toe for a small price, small enough so that even the poorest could bathe. That's a lot of small business owners. Hottest water in town, step right up, step right up. The Romans came up with an idea to build a spa house thing which could be flooded and heated by the floor beneath it. With a giant fireplace inside the spa, it was lit by hand and blown through the vents under the floor. Damn, they were smart, huh? Hot and steamy and good for the body. And clean. Well, cleaner. The bathhouse was a technology of its own and it seemed like humanity was headed in the right direction. No, no they were not. Number nine, wiping. Do as the Romans did. It's thought that these people thought of literally everything before us. Oh yeah? How about pogo sticks, think of that? Huh? pogo -onitis? No, no you didn't. Look that up, did they? Over the years, I've had some pretty shitty jobs, but nothing as shitty as this one. Literally. Uh, sire, would you like fronteth to backeth or backeth to fronteth today, sire? That's right, there was a job for that. People had to have had started wiping at some point, right? But who exactly and when? The groom of the stool, chief gentlewoman of the privy chamber. Call it whatever you like, we know what they did. So what exactly did they wipe with? Well, usually hay, sticks, fur, or even seashells. Every single one of those sounds itchy and terrible. 
I know what Charmin can do sometimes, and I can't imagine what a piece of oak could have done back then. Was there splinter taker routers as well? I can't help but feel, although, how painful and stinky it was. I'm sure there was at least one shared laugh, a little quality time spent with some royalty to say the least. Although this career is speculated, both King Charles I and King James I had them, so unless they decided they wanted to do that after them, someone must have continued doing it. I hope for a pretty penny at least. Those waste management dudes have pretty good benefits. Filing your taxes looking for a job description? Uh, ah yes, here it is, wiper. Number eight, urine. Okay, is this just gonna be disgusting the entire time? Well, the answer is yes. History's pretty disgusting. Okay, this one is weird because right when we think we've figured it all out, something jarring happens, like a jar of piss and all the health benefits it had throughout history. Uh, I'm sorry, what? Well, at least they thought it did. In ancient Rome, not only was this liquid gold sold for, well, gold, it was often traded as a prominent good, sold for its multitude of healing purposes. You see, people have been using urine for thousands of years. That's right, this destructive, toxic bodily fluid could be repurposed, salvaged into many different topicals and treatments. From hair loss to your daily skincare routine, it was not only great for staining and softening leather made for shoes and clothes, it was a natural teeth whitener, an antiseptic. <laughs> That's right, from ancient Rome to as late as the 20th century, people have been tinkering and tailoring with their pee. Egyptians did it, Greeks did it. Urine is the body's natural antiseptic and was soon turning septic. Like the science behind this alone is what your buddy tells you, you know what I mean? Oh, rolled ankle? Yeah, yeah, just piss on it. Got ghosts? Ah, just pee on it. The ailment for all your needs. Disgust. Number seven, teeth. Invented in 1488 by Sir Robert Tooth. Okay, I'm joking, no. Teeth were never officially invented, but what we did for them and how we cared for them had people scratching their heads for the last millennia. We've all had a toothache at some point in our lives, so they must have had them back then. In fact, oral hygiene was utterly disgusting. I didn't brush my teeth after my coffee and I can already feel it. Ew. People's teeth were so bad throughout history that dentists were actually training and teaching each other what to do about the huge toothworm problem. That's right. Imagine worms growing inside your teeth. Well, due to the swelling and pressure, people thought there were actual bugs or evil spirits living within their sore tooth, serving them extreme pain. Nope, just an infection. You need a root canal. Oh, and actual worms and bugs living in the tooth. Uh, yeah, you see this gray area right here? Uh, that's a ladybug, right? It's medieval England and things were pretty medieval. Right down to the surgery, and if you had an impacted wisdom tooth, well, that wasn't covered. England, 400 AD. People started this new trend of oral hygiene cleaning, but it wasn't spin brushes and floss, no more like mint and vinegar and prayer. Just kind of swoosh it all around in your mouth and wipe your teeth with your shirt and call it another year. If you were lucky enough to rinse your mouth out at the time, then you could have saved yourself a visit to the medieval dentist chair. Well, actually just a slab of rock you sit up against and have a friend who's good at ripping. And there you go, buddy. Hey, wake up. The infection alone from the dirty tools going into your mouth is making me itchy. I feel like my breath stinks more now after I've read this topic. Anybody have any gum? Number six. Toilet paper. Finally, something we recognize. Invented originally in China in 851 from the Tang Dynasty, these soft fabric sheets were designed for, well, you know what it was designed for, but yes, mostly the emperor's bathroom breaks and soon caught on for the commonwealth as well. The higher the class, the softer and more luxurious the material. From leather to silk, butts were seeing a kinder, gentler side of hygiene. Two ply bark versus four ply silk. The use of toilet paper throughout Europe is a messy one. Again, wipers and hay and stuff like that. It wasn't until the toilet paper rule created by Joseph Gaiety in 1857 that this hygiene method would solidify and stay for keeps. The classic under versus over is the tale as old as time. You ever wanna get into a quick argument at someone's house? Just peek in the loo, see if they're rocking beard or mullet. It's the simplest way to have a know-it-all show you the patent and tell you how to wipe your own ass. Charmin. Number five. Lice. Yes, while we're talking about hair care, why not touch on the subject of lice? It's a problem everywhere, not just in your elementary school. Ancient China had lice problems just like ancient Egypt did. While almost everyone chose the path of baldness in Egypt, it was not so in China. No, other than honey locusts and rice water to clean your hair, one of the common practices to deal with lice was to, um, well, it was to eat the lice that you picked out of your hair. Hey. Grub is grub, but I think uh, I think I'd like to move on from this topic now. Let's let's go. Let's go. 
<laughs> Let's get the heck out. Number four, poo poo stick. I'm sorry that we have to talk about this, but actually, you know what? I'm not that sorry. Just as it does now, going to drop the kids off at the pool in ancient China left you with the task of cleaning yourself up afterwards. Wiping your bottom, that's what I'm talking about. Now, they did have paper back in ancient China, like we talked about in our ancient Chinese inventions video, but paper was expensive and the only ones who really used it were the emperor and royalty like him who would use straw paper. Before that, and for everyone else, people would use a stick-like tool called a chugi, I'm sorry if I pronounced that wrong, which was basically bamboo strips that were shaped to be thin and flat and slightly wide with rounded edges. Some of these even had great water absorption and a lovely scent. Those who were a bit more fortunate would then wash with water, kind of like an ancient bidet, and then use some good smelling stuff to make it all better. Other than that, a lot of people were cool with using leaves or sticks and stones, and honestly, whatever could do the trick, really. I mean, when you gotta go, you gotta go. Number three, using dirt to clean? Okay, okay, not dirt, but soil. Ancient cultures, including the ancient Chinese, would use soil as a tool in cleaning which actually had the benefit of being able to help remove oil stains. Now how did this happen? Apparently, it is believed to be caused by the alkaline qualities of the soil that really helps with the removal of oil. Soil and oil, I did not like that. Which the Chinese actually seemed to figure out how to specifically utilize. The Chinese used a kind of natural alkali to clean their clothes, which evolved to be scented to help keep the clothes nice and funky smelling. The use of this stuff was so popular that there were tons of scented alkali stores that opened up around China, with some even becoming pretty famous. Maybe not unusual, but definitely very interesting and a precursor to modern laundry soaps. So, hmm. Number two, water purification. While this may be considered more of a health thing than a hygiene thing, I mean, I'd argue that hygiene is health, so get at me. <laughs> the ancient Chinese discovered and made extensive use of groundwater for drinking, and they kept record of how they would keep their wells and well water nice and clean. The construction of the wells was pretty important, with the bottom of the wells regularly being dredged to keep the water clean. The inner walls of the wells were reinforced with ceramic bricks and tiles to stop that pesky soil and other impurities from falling into the water, and the openings of the wells were covered to safeguard against contamination from above the ground. The cleaning of wells was even institutionalized as a feast in some places. So cleaner water and food, it's a win-win. Knowing early on that drinking water could make them pretty sick, the Chinese boiled their water and allowed the sediment to settle before using it for cooking and drinking. They also knew what was up with water. They just knew what was up in general. It's pretty great. Okay, let's move on. I'm talking too much. Number one, no stink. Smelling funky fresh and clean was all the rage, as it should be today too. I ain't trying to be on the subway with a nose full of body odor, just as I wouldn't wish to submit anyone else to that. To be fair, not everyone knows they stanky and some people don't get a choice, but back in ancient China, those who were wealthy enough would spice up their weekly baths with roots, flowers, peppers, ginger, and all that yummy smelling goodness to basically create a lovely smelling cleansing soup to plop themselves into. Women would also carry around aromatic pouches that would just keep a nice smell around them at all times. Those who were not as wealthy would have to find other means to keep things fresh though. One that I'm not too sure would actually help smell-wise was applying their own pee-pee to their pits once a year on New Year's. This was done as a kind of a disinfectant. But like I said, I'm, I'm not too sure about this one, but if anyone has the knowledge, uh, first-hand or otherwise, keep it to yourself, uh, let me know, like down in the comments. I'm, I'm genuinely curious. Number 10, no lice. You know in elementary school when they would check everyone for lice and one poor sucker had to get their head shaved and walk around as that bald kid for like a month and would probably get bullied? Well that ain't gonna happen back in ancient Egypt because everyone shaved their heads to avoid lice back then and priests would shave their whole bodies just like Michael Phelps. Instead of having actual hair of their own, they would wear wigs. Wigs sometimes made of human hair. That honestly was a lot better in that harsh desert sun. Lice and other little pests like that, like fleas, were not wanted. And yeah, they still aren't. But it led to some honestly interesting solutions. For example, a warm potion of date meal and water was believed to drive away fleas and lice. They would use cat's fat to keep away mice, I made a rhyme, and one that probably actually did something was when they used a solution of natron water and salt in their humble abodes to eliminate and repel fleas. Number nine, ancient sunscreen. 
As soon as summer comes around, game over. I burn so easily. That's why I'm a fan of winter. I don't have to keep applying sunscreen to my face all day, all night. And feel like I'm about to faint, obviously. Canada gets quite hot. But how did Egyptians beat the heat in ancient times? What was their trick? They didn't have banana breeze, FPF, SPF 90, whatever the hell it is. Ancient Egyptians valued their skin as a symbol of beauty, right? You think your morning skincare routine requires a lot of work? Think again, Laura. Their routine was written on tomb walls and scrolls. Rice bran containing UV absorbing gamma orizinol was used to block the sun off. Yeah, it was that hard. Jasmine as well helped repair sun damage. And ancient Greeks as well, they used olive oil as sunscreen as well as ancient Egyptians. Which as far as UV protection goes, it did absolutely nothing. You'd be burnt and extremely dehydrated, but also you'd have some nice tan lines and you wouldn't be as pale as me, so it wasn't all bad. Number eight, the finest of cosmetics. The cosmetics of ancient Egypt were not just for looking good, they were for feeling good too. Like on the inside. Now, as such, those professionals who made the stuff took it pretty seriously. Not just because of a passion for the art, but also because they'd be judged pretty damn harshly if they did a bad job. If they sucked, it would mean having the whole neighborhood give you a bad reputation. And in the cosmetics business, just like show business, it's all about that reputation. It would also mean some harsh judgment from the big boys upstairs meaning the gods when you met the afterlife. So yeah, they wanted to do a good job. And to meet that end, they would try and use the finest of ingredients, as they should when people have to put this stuff on their skins and right next to their eyes and stuff. Number seven, deodorant. Before the Old Spice guy was born, what did people even do to smell good? What, I don't, what happened? Deodorant was actually first introduced to the public back in the late 1800s. It was called Mum. It was a cream that used zinc oxide. It was stored in a metal container, nothing like speed stick at all. It wasn't discreet or anything. It was bad, but ancient Egyptians, eh, even worse. They had to use ostrich eggs when it came to smelling good in the pits. They made perfumes as well and were among the first to use any type of deodorant. So that's, that's a pretty good start. Thank you. Thank you so much, ancient Egyptians. Hence the ostrich egg factor. They had to start somewhere. They mixed a little fat, tamarisk, tortoise shell, and then nuts and bam, there you go. You're ready for the day, just pop it on. Another method was a little more yummy than the ostrich eggs and nuts method. Egyptians would use porridge balls. Yeah, flavored porridge rolled up and securely tucked under your arms. Honestly, that seems like a better alternative. Sometimes when you put antiperspirants or like deodorant on, it gets like all, it all crumbles apart. It's like feta cheese all of a sudden. You're like, what happened to this stick? I want, I would rather have porridge balls than just call it a day, boom. Number six, get this man a Tic Tac or something. Just like I use mints to cure my nasty tea breath, which I argue is worse than coffee breath, the ancient Egyptians used breath mints to keep things fresh. Honestly, they actually sound kind of good. Frankincense, cinnamon, melon, pine seeds and cashews put together, ground up and bound together in candy using honey. <laughs> Just heat that bad boy over the fire and let it cool and boom, breath mints. I like it. I like it a lot. These breath mints would be made commercially by those fine cosmeticians and dentists. Or they could even be made at home. Some archaeological finds of bowls, jars, and other dishes suggest that they may have been candy dishes that would hold the lovely taste in little suckers. Always gotta keep things fun, fresh, and flirty back in ancient Egypt. And breath mints would certainly help you do the trick. <laughs> nice. Number five. Well, I didn't have any corn. Austin Powers reference for you. You know the character I'm talking about, I can't say it. Here's a hygiene product that just makes me question life. The very fabric of our existence. Whether it was the Big Bang or the Almighty Creator, there's just no way this was ever meant to happen. I just, it doesn't make any sense. One day, somebody was walking along the Nile River and was unfortunate enough to step in crocodile droppings. Now, most people would say, gross, and move on. Oh, no, not the people of ancient Egypt. They felt the stinky, squishy unholiness on their feet and said, yes, we must bathe in this. <laughs> and they did. They took the forbidden mud bath, the brown tsunami, the cesspit of no hope. You can call it whatever you want, really. It's, it's horrible either way you look at it. Supposedly, it was meant to keep you young and beautiful. My only question would be, at what point did they realize poo baths were a mistake? Was it when they were smelling it and it was bad? Or was it when it accidentally got in your mouth or something like that? And you're just like, oh, what? It, it walked up that out of my mouth. That's the Scottish Egyptian, in case you were wondering. Number four, waste removal. This one is kind of a broad stroke, but hear me out. There's no plumbing, no waste removal, and people kind of just 
go wherever they want. A lot of that unhygienic waste is kind of just laying about. However, the people of Egypt also had the advantage of the Nile River, which means they used that bad boy for everything. Transport, irrigation, a water source, and of course, a, a bathroom. Which in case you didn't know, your source of water and irrigation should be two separate, that, that shouldn't be, they shouldn't go together, that's not good. This is a good explanation for the plagues of Egypt, besides the sin, bad sinners, no sinning. As years of that kind of negligent waste management are liable to make any pharaoh sick. Don't mix your water with the poo, don't do that, that's bad, don't do that. Number three, sunscreen. This should come as no secret to anyone out there, but with my rosy cheeks and fair complexion, I would not do very well in the suns of ancient Egypt. Honestly, I don't know how Luke Skywalker lived on Tatooine with those twin sons. Without a little copper tone action, you know what I'm saying? The Egyptians had an answer to that problem, however. Not the whole living on Tatooine part, that, that just kind of sucks no matter what. Blue milk is weird. They had a makeshift sunscreen using rice bran extracts and a few other ingredients that were meant to help protect against the sun's rays. How effective was it really? Not sure, because the only stuff I'm willing to test out is the real stuff. And if I get burnt, then I start peeling. And then somebody has to rub aloe vera all over me. Be right back, I'm gonna get some sun. Number two, cursed craft dinner. You've got no plumbing in your palace, and it's time for dinner. So how does an Egyptian royal make his favorite pot of KD without water? I mean, if college kids can do it in their dorm room, surely they can master the art of post-secondary cuisine. Well, for some unlucky folks, it means taking a pot and walking down to that old Nile River almost like people rely on water or something, and take a big scoop of water and bring it back. But while you begin to scoop some water, you may notice someone is picking up crocodile dung, and people are bathing in the water. And, and to your left, there's a maiden washing clothes, and to your right, there's a man doing something I can't repeat on YouTube. Oh well, time to scoop some more water up and consume this clean, nice water at home. Oh, this is the best. Tastes like the village. It's nice. Number one, pink milkshake. Does it still count as hygiene if you ain't breathing? I say yes. Besides the pyramids and maybe the Nile, mummies are the most famous things about Egypt. And in a weird way, it is hygiene. Hygiene for the afterlife. When someone super important passes on, it's time for a little game of operation. Stomach, liver, intestines are removed and put into jars. You never know when you might need that next. The heart is left because it's the heart and the Egyptians were diehard poets, so you got souls in there, you gotta keep that. The most grim process to me, however, is turning the human brain into a forbidden milkshake by mashing it with a small spike and then draining it out in what must have been the grossest waterfall ever. I, oh God, that just, oh God, that's so gross. <laughs> anyway, then you take some linen and start wrapping the mummy up like a dad wrapping last minute gifts on Christmas Eve. Bada bing, bada boom, there you go. Buddy is prepped for the afterlife. Uh, don't mind me, I'm just gonna be sick from the brain milkshake. Ooh. Ooh. Number 10, the forbidden toothpaste. If I looked into your bathroom right now, what would I see? Oh, uh, you forgot to flush the toilet. If it's yellow, let it mellow. If it's brown, flush it down. Seems you've forgotten your own golden rule there. What I was actually looking at was for a flavor of toothpaste that you had. Classic mint, maybe you got cinnamon. Maybe you go for the whole bamboo toothbrush charcoal toothpaste vibe. Hey, I respect it, good on you for making better choices. But bad on the Aztecs for making gross choices. Ever look at some forbidden lemonade and think, hey, add some salt to this. And now we got ourselves a bona fide toothpaste? Of course you didn't, because you ain't a crazy person. Or at least I hope you're not. But yeah, Aztecs used to brush their teeth with an unholy mixture of golden broth, pee, and salt. Yeah, I. why would you add salt to pee? I, I think it cleans teeth, sure. You just have to borrow an Egyptian breathman after. It's no big deal, it's fine. It's good for your teeth, it's fine. Number nine, high stakes. Any good game of a sport will have you at the edge of your seat and dropping all cheese flavored snacks around you just so you can keep your eyes glued to the screen. The Aztecs did not have access to such finger licking good things like Doritos, but what they did have was a sport that was very high stakes, maybe too high actually, as if you didn't win, it could very well cost you your life. A game called, here we go, Chris is gonna like me pronouncing this, called Omalazitli. With its nine pound rubber ball and eye shaped court, players had to pass the ball through a small stone ring. This game was taken very seriously, like ritual serious, and you didn't want to be on the losing side. 
as it may cost you your head. Yes, even sports events in modern times have gotten violent, sure. But if we started lopping off heads for our losses, well, Tom Brady would have a lot more blood on his hands, wouldn't he? Number 8. Hot Chocolate As a Canadian, I cannot tell you how important the medicinal qualities that are a hot chocolate on a wet, cold winter's day. You've been slipping and sliding down a snow hill for hours, and your snow pants are soaking wet. Partially from the snow and also because your dad made you go down the super scary hill and it was too much for you. Don't tell mom. Hot chocolate was important for the Aztecs too. More so just chocolate, actually. It was used for a number of things. First off, after the beans have been roasted, they smell amazing. So it most likely went into some perfumes and other lovely smelling things that they used. It was also used as currency, strangely enough. And it was also, also, also used as a ritual drink. Except they didn't exactly have sugar, so they used other things, other ingredients like peppers and other unusual flavor enhancers to, for chocolate. I the pepper, I, I never understood that. People are like, it's hot, like Mexican hot chocolate. It's, it's pepper and chocolate. It's a weird hot, cho hot spicy chocolate. Not a, not a fan, not a fan. Number seven, corn goddess. I like corn just as much as the next guy. Roasted, boiled, and on the cob. Slap some salted butter on that bad boy, Whew, it's time to dig in. Make sure you got the corn on the cob holders though. The little metal thingies that you'll probably end up stabbing yourself with later, that's just, that's just how it goes. Besides backyard summer barbecues, corn was an important staple of the Aztecs. So important that they had a festival to honor the corn goddess. Which to me is kind of a lame thing to be a god of, but alright, let's run with it. Zilonan Festival had the women let their hair loose and green corn placed in it to honor the god, the corn god. A forced female volunteer was dressed as the goddess and after many days of what I'm assuming is eating and worshipping corn, the forced volunteer was sacrificed by the people to once again honor the corn god. You'd think a bowl of corn would do the job, but no, she's got a lust for blood so that means uh, off with the head. Number 6. End Times We all know what ancient civilizations are like with predicting the future, or more specifically, predicting the end times. Mayans thought everything was going to fade to black in 2012. Didn't, did it. Some people really thought this was going to happen. I always thought that Buddy just didn't get around to finishing the thing, but hey, whatever works. Well, if it was real, why didn't the world end? Well, the Aztec answer to that was the new fire ceremony. Another ceremony, why not? Basically, every once in a while, things got a little crazy. It was a time to cleanse, a spring cleaning, if you will. People stopped working, destroyed household items, and at the end of a five day cycle, some priests would take a dude up a volcano and toss him in there like I toss away bad report cards from my mother. All this to prevent the end of the world. Virus, act of God, bad hygiene. Whatever it was, just good old fashioned blanket solution. <laughs> Number five, moss. We're halfway through and I'll say it again, I'll remind you all again, I have the utmost respect for you ladies. As a guy doing this list and like writing this list, I mean the things you had to craft back then and then you know put, uh, oh my lord. For example, going back to the 10th century, this was a time long before Tampax was ever even a thing. Women were forced to get creative when it came to personal hygiene. They had to just figure it out themselves and literally collect grass or moss, sheepskin lined with cotton. It was mostly moss all the time. You all are absolute troopers. If it wasn't moss, other solutions were small pieces of wood with lint wrapped around it. Number four, Q-tips. If you haven't heard, Q-tips are not for your ears. Yeah, I thought this was a rumor. Turns out we're all lawbreakers. I use two at the same time if I'm in a rush. No, flip them. I'm a vigilante when it comes to Q-tips. Q-tips were invented in 1923 by Leo Gertzenzang, right after his wife stuck cotton balls to the end of a toothpick. Kinda sounds like his wife invented Q-tips, but okay, we'll roll with it. From 1923 to 1926, they were named Baby Gays, and then Q-tip Baby Gays, and then finally just Q-tips. That's like a Sweet Baby Rays, that barbecue sauce. Oh, so good. If they just called it Sweet Rays, maybe they gave it up to the baby, I don't know. You have to try and work it out. I don't know what the bit is, but I'm like, hey, that's a great sauce. And I just thought of that sauce. Baby Ray's Baby Gays. Back in those days, Q-tips were dipped in boric acid and they were intended to sterilize wounds. Yeah, and we're just out here like... <laughs> My eyes roll back every time. I get so deep. I go way too deep. I get too deep where I'm like, oh, it's gone. Huh, there it is. Magic. I'm a magician. After this, there were even Q-soaps, Q-oils, Q-creams. It's like Apple. Like, I iPad, I phone, the other eye stuff. So what's this rumor that they're not supposed to be in your ears? What's that about? 
Well, in 2008, Dennis Fitzgerald brought forward concerns about Q-tips and how they're really pushing earwax into your ear canal, leading to possible infections more than anything. When Cheesebro Pawns bought the company back in 1962, they added a warning on the box, a warning that we and I gladly still ignore. Just talking about this, I'm like, oh, I'm gonna go clean my stuff out. Mm. I have Q-tips in my bag, literally, I'm always prepared. Always strapped. Number three, hair removal trick. In the late 19th century, something called thallium actate started to sweep the nation. It was a hair removal method, which even today is the talk of the town. Laser off that peach fuzz for good. Zero. Gone. Thallium was used back in the day, but originally thallium was prescribed for those who suffered with ringworm. But even so, thallium didn't do anything per se about the ringworm, it just caused the patient's hair to fall off. So the ringworm was then easier to find. I'd prefer a haircut if you ask me, but sure. Thallium does the trick as well. Eventually, thallium was sold as a cream, a toxic cream. It should never touch your skin at all, and it's a face cream. Are you kidding? This thing was once rat poison as well, and now we're rubbing it around like it's Bath & Body Works Noel cream. It's my favorite cream, the green one. Oh God, gone in two days. This was outlawed, thankfully, in the 30s, but it had to get bad pretty first. Number two, Aqua Tofana. Going back to the 1600s for this one. Also, if you're a murderino, you'll enjoy this bit of dark history. Aqua Tofana was a cosmetic that was sold to women in the early 1630s. It was a cosmetic that doubled as a poison. Yeah, sneaky, right? Some Assassin's Creed shit going on here. The origins of this deadly cosmetic that was sold and responsible for around like 600 deaths is pretty wild. So back in 1632, two women, Francesca Lasarda and Teofana Diamato, they both created this poison. They worked together and created it so that when their husbands kissed them, on the cheek, they would then be poisoned. But eventually, Tiafana was caught and executed for her crimes, but her recipe carried on through her daughter, Yulia Tiafana. She took this deadly recipe to Rome and then kept manufacturing it. Inside this cursed cosmetic was arsenic, lead, and belladonna. Colorless, tasteless, and one of the deadliest. And finally, coming in at number one, more ancient birth control. Okay, we kicked this list off catching up with ancient Egyptians and the uh, aid of acacia trees and all that jazz. So I figured we'd end on a ridiculous birth control method from the ancient Roman days. Seranus, who was known as a Greek gynecologist back then, his idea for Planned Parenthood was not a good one. It was not a good idea. He wrote that after you, you know, bump uglies, in order to prevent pregnancy, the woman must squat and sneeze. First of all, no, not a chance, no, no. And also, if you're thinking about it, no. Secondly, who can sneeze on demand? I certainly can't. I had a really nice time tonight, cheers. <clears throat> that's, not, that's not possible, no. Many methods from the past are questionable. In ancient China, it was commonly told that drinking hot mercury could prevent pregnancy. <clears throat> yeah, leave mercury away from your body, that will literally kill you. Ancient Greeks would drink blacksmith water because they too thought the exposure to lead could prevent getting pregnant. This idea came back around World War I as well. Women were working in factories and actually trying to get exposed to lead. That was the whole idea. Bad. These are pretty dark, so I'll leave you on this one. In the Dark Ages, European women wore amulets made of weasel testicles to magically ward off pregnancies. Poor weasels. Black magic is the worst, isn't it? Our story first begins with Shinto, which had purification rituals required before prayer, such as sweeping and washing. Sixth century, Buddhism is introduced, and the casting aside of all impurities, which is part of that, can be done by bathing, washing away the seven ailments while simultaneously taking on the seven blessings. Bathing culture changed in the Edo period as Sentos brought bathhouses to commoners' daily lives. Before, they were only able to soak in the river. Baths in this period were steaming waters, with the bather all often only soaking the lower part of their legs and washing water upwards. Late Edo period also brought sufuro, which is the first bath in which bathers would actually submerge to the shoulders. Men and women were also sharing the same bath, and it was commonplace for bathhouses to be mixed, something that freaked good old Commodore Matthew Perry right out when he visited Japan between 1853 and 54. Nudity doesn't always have to be primal, dude. Onsen, or hot springs, is a public bath in Japan that uses hot spring water to clean and relax your body, which has an endless list of health benefits from the mineral rich water. In the Showa period starting in 1926, more residential buildings with internal baths were built, and home baths became the new norm. However, still feel free to visit one of the many onsens and sentos that still exist in Japan. From the bottom to the top, let's talk hair care. Long, beautiful, shiny hair, and the Japanese believed each strand carried spiritual energy, ritualizing hair, but also how to groom it. Women in ancient Japan believed that as the comb passed through, it would gather each strand's spiritual energy. One of the most famous works from the Heian period 
period was the tale of Genji. It talks about the traditional Japanese beauty and hair care. It detailed using a fine comb and how important it was to have this long straight black hair for Japanese women and even men at the time. All women seemingly had this Rapunzel goal and no art was depicted showing otherwise. Aristocratic women often achieved hair lengths that reached the floor if not past. In order to keep their hair super straight and shiny, Japanese women had one effective hair care routine. The secret? Combing. Japanese women often combed their hair right up to five times a day. And while we're on this subject, how about the power of a wooden comb? The most popular materials were the sleekish stones like jade, polished gold, but most of all, boxwood. It's naturally oily, so the combs are anti-static, avoid breakage, and are gentle on the scalp. Traditionally, boxwood combs would have been created from trees only after they've turned 35 years old. The wood is harvested in August or September when the weather is hot, but the humidity is low. Then it's dried for three years. The process from start to finish can take up to 60 steps, and the Japanese government officially recognizes close to 200 traditional national industries, and comb making tops the list to this day. Traditionally, women would be given a set of these combs when they married. They are used to create every possible hairstyle from a slick back top knot of sumo wrestlers to the perfectly precise updo of a geisha. Even to this date, every 20 years, boxwood combs are sent to the Isi Shrine in, in Japan, where they're ritually burned in sacrifice to the sun goddess. But there's more to it than just the comb. It's all in the tsubaki sauce. In Japan, tsubaki oil was used for thousands of years as a cooking and machine oil. However, on Oshima Island, the women who harvested the oil were noticed to have long, beautiful hair and radiant, clean skin. Naturally, they've been using the oil harvested from the tsubaki nuts on their hair and skin since it was all over their hands from working. This news flew and suddenly far and wide, Japanese women started using tsubaki for beauty purposes. Science time! Tsubaki oil contains a very high level of oleic acid, which will control the water loss while making your hair softer and more pliable and minimize shedding. Lyolytic acid in the oil stimulates hair growth, maintains healthy scalp conditions, and improves moisture retention. Tsubaki oil is non-greasy and an excellent all-around moisturizer for hair and skin. Its excellent emolinant properties keep skin and hair supple, and tsubaki also features prominently in the art of traditional pattern Japanese designs. At, dating back since the 11th century, they're called wagara, where it became popular in the motif of the Meiji period. Red, white, and black. The country's flag is one shade short from matching the most traditional makeup palette there is. The old Japanese proverb, white skin covers seven flaws, describes the obsession Japanese women had for fair skin throughout the centuries. This dates back to the Nara period in 710, when Japanese culture was heavily influenced by Chinese and Korean culture. During the Heian period, Japanese beauty aesthetics shifted away from imitation. They continued to apply the white powder to their faces, but then they started plucking eyebrows and repainting them higher, and then they blackened their teeth. By early Edo, aka the 1600s, the red, white, and black color palette was in effect. Red lip rouge and fingernail polish, white face powder, and black teeth and eyebrow pencils. Pigments were produced from fresh safflowers, became so expensive it was said to even be worth its weight in gold. During the 1800s, women began to focus more on the health of their skin rather than just the appearance. A beauty manual published in 1813 described desirable skin as being moist and naturally colored. In the late 19th century, the women's suffrage movement began to take hold across Japan. As women began to advocate for protection against oppressive patriarchal practices, the concerns for beauty began to change and workplaces and schools began to drop requirements for makeup. And finally, from the 1980s, beauty started to move away from emulating the West. More Japanese women were able to represent their own Japanese identity internationally. Models like Yamaguchi Sayoaka, who made it onto the international scene, served as inspiration for young Japanese women to embrace their own beauty. But I know I can't breeze by something I'd mentioned, so. Number five, the great stink. Um, the what, what? Oh, no, 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 yeah, I read that right. The Great Stink of 1858 was an event in central London in the summer, during which the hot weather exaggerated and amplified the smell of untreated human waste and gunk that had washed up on both in and on the banks of the River Thames. The problem had been growing for years with an out-of-date technology and overflowing sewage system that emptied directly into the river. The stank was thought to have been the root cause of a number of contagious diseases and three outbreaks of cholera before it was agreed upon that a small problem was emerging. You think? Long story short, all the garbage, human waste, bloated bodies were all just washing up around the same time. Hey, I caught one. No, oh, that's an arm. Okay. And just cooking in all that sun all day? I know what August feels like, and I've smelt my garage and garbage day, and I can't imagine the smell already in central London at that time. And for people to have complained so much that it was even stinkier, that's absolutely rotten. Number four, nose gaze. I was just thinking, where are all these inventions and blueprints on how to stop the smell? 
If you can knit metal into a crop top, you can cover your mouth and nose, can't you? Well, close enough. Nose gays were invented. Basically just big nose plugs one would wear day to day to drown out the smell of absolute filth. Just plug it up and ignore it was their mentality. A makeshift wad of bunched up herbs and flowers shoved up your nose, blocking the nasal cavity from the stank that followed. Just see number five. A poo-pourri for each nostril. Would this make things worse, ignoring the smell? Wouldn't that make it even harder to find out where it's coming from? Nope, just band-aid it. It's gonna disappear on its own. We're humans, we're designed to smell stuff for our own survival. The smell is like what lets us know not to go down there. Oh, no, no. Like, wouldn't everything just smell like roses at that point? These people were trying to avoid the stinky streets because that actually meant that's where the infection and disease was actually hanging out. The blind leading the blind. Number three, flushing. Okay, we're making some ground here. We got toilet paper, we got something for the smell. So now where do we put it? Well, plumbing and flushing wasn't connected to each house like it is today. See, the Greeks and Romans had it down to a science. They built drainage systems and learned from the ancient Mesopotamian people how to exactly deal with the problem of waste. A system of pipes, tubes, and drains. The bathroom problem seemed like an easy solution. Use gravity downhill to dispose of the waste outside the city. And here's the kicker. It can even be reused and repurposed at the end as an irrigation system, further nurturing the farming of crops. No, that's good. No, he's right. And then it disappears and literally goes downhill again. After the Roman Empire had fallen, this European dark sanitation era had begun and hygiene sort of just slipped away. People weren't really concerned with things like disease and plague and instead leaned into real science like witchcraft or burning cats for fun. You know, important stuff. It wasn't until about the mid 1850s where people revisited this age old problem and recreated and did exactly the same thing science we already knew. Things were unnecessarily stinky for way too long. It wasn't until the British colonies started tinkering in Boston around the 1700s that proper piping and toiletry transport was eventually built and catalogued. Thus was born the first sanitation system, again. And we still see it today, thank God. Number two, disinfectants. How did people exactly know if something was clean or not? They couldn't have just seen the particles back then. Let's hear a chamber pot. Clean. People were plugging their noses so they couldn't even smell anything. They couldn't smell if it was clean or not. There certainly wasn't a demand for a fresh lemon scent that we're all used to. This was the birth of some basic antiseptic. Chemists were mixing and matching chemicals and a new form of cleaning agent was introduced in the 1890s by German chemist science Gustav Rappenstrock in hopes to rid the country of the overflowing cholera epidemic and seize the spread of germs and the disease. By mixing benzalkonium and hydrogen peroxide, you were left with a chemical compound that would destroy and clean infections on medical patients. Light bulb. Thus leaning towards the direction of an all-purpose surface cleaner, killing bacteria and ridding the area of harmful toxins. And drum roll please, Lysol was created. That's right, the same Lysol we use today. This was a push in the right way for humanity. An easy to use liquid cleaner that would aid disinfecting everything in its way. I've seen the bottle and the Wemyss labels. Must have been even stronger back then too. Hope no one spilled it on themselves in testing. Ooh, ouch, that is a class one chemical burn. <laughs> You're just gonna wanna pee on that for 12 to 13 days. And number one, soap. Finally, the end of all our ailments. Soap, the answer. Well, not really. See, it's been around since the Romans because they literally did everything before us and stop bragging, we get it. Made out of animal fats, ash, and mostly lye, these makeshift balls of soap were invented years ago. And then forgotten, and then invented again, and then forgotten again. Cleanliness was loose, remember, and it was almost uncool to believe in science, and it wasn't really until the mass production of this chemical detergent that it really stuck. Soap was predominantly sold produced and commercialized in the late 1800s. By this time, scientists were fiddling around with things like Lysol and more chemical compounds, sparking its way to the study of germs, a vital step towards large-scale soap production. And it actually started in 1791, when a French chemist, Nicolas Leblanc, patented a system for making soda ash from salt, at which point added with animal fat, and there you have it. The slippery bar we're all used to today. The discovery made soap making one of America's fastest growing industries in 1850. And it seemed from then on in it was only up. It's crazy to think that someone at this time, even after soap was invented, were still spit shining surgical instruments to be clean. That's good.